Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Riti Datta and I am back with my tutorial videos. And this video is going to be my first video of the Java series. The video on these series will not only help you to crack the Java interviews of the top product companies as well as service companies, but it will also help you to you know grasp the different concepts of Java, which will really, really help you while you will be working for any company. So now this video is very specific to DSA and uh, this video is basically on the collection framework. So I'm going to cover the entire collection framework in this video that is actually required in your day to day life while you will be working for a company and also it will be required specially for cracking your DSA interviews. So after solving multiple DSA problems in Java and cracking and giving multiple uh, coding interviews for top tech companies in Java, I am making this video, you know, compiling all the experience that I have and I'm going to exactly tell you that what are the things that you need to learn in collection framework step by step so that you don't you know get too much intimidated and i'm going to show you the implementation side of things as well and if you don't know anything you just know that java basics like loops and inheritance in this video is definitely for you trust me by the end of this video you would be able to understand uh, like how can you apply collection frameworks uh, to solve your dsa problems in java not only dsa will also help you to apply collection and understand code base of you know the companies where you are working on right but most of this will be specific uh, for the dsa part i'm not going to cover all the interfaces and classes that exist but i'm definitely going to cover the, all the important topics that are required and that are used mostly so trust me by the end of this video you won't be having any issues solving dsa problems uh, using java collections framework so without any further ado now let's get started and we will get to know more about it in the video so first of all let's understand what is a collection right so a collection allows a group of objects to be treated as single unit now we will jump into this definition a little bit later while we actually start working uh, with the collection framework right so the java collections uh, framework provides a set of standard utility classes uh, for managing various kinds of collections right so the core framework is provided in the java util package and it comprises the three parts uh, the core interface uh, the set of implementations basically which are the implementations of the core interfaces and some static utility methods which are found in collection and arrays which we are going to see at the end of the video so first let's take a look at the core interface right so, so at the top of the chain of the collection chain there lies this iterable interface right now i know this is a little bit of theory so please bear with me because if you understand this part really really well then a lot of things down the video will be very very clear for you and also remembering the methods and classes will be really really easy for you right uh, so also you can understand how collection framework leverages the concept of interfaces right so even if you don't understand like why interface is in required in the first place so this video will also help you to clear all those relatable doubts as well right so you'll understand a lot of things so just, just bear with me right uh, don't don't get too much intimidated by the theory or get bored by it because these all these things are very very important and trust me i've compiled this video in such a way that only the important parts i'm going to hold it out to you so now coming back to the video, uh, there is this iterable interface that sits at the top of this collection chain. And this iterable is actually, as you can see, it's not a part of the collection framework. It is a part of the java.lang package, right? So what is iterable and why do we require it? We are going to come uh, to it uh, later in the video. But first, let's take a look at the, the core interfaces of collection. So now you see the a collection is an interface, right? And it is not a concrete class, by the way. So you can't instantiate a collection, right? So collection extends an iterable. Why it does so, we will see it right later in the video. And then from collection, we have a list interface, we have a queue interface, we have a set, and uh, these are the three interfaces basically that extends a collection, right? And then a queue is extended by a DQ. We are going to see all of these interfaces and their concrete implementations in action. Then there is this uh, set, which is extended by sorted set, and then the sorted set interface is extended by the navigable set. So just to give you a familiarity to get started, so once we touch this uh, topics or once we touch this interfaces uh, towards the later part of the video, you don't get too much surprised. Okay. Then we have a map, which is again an interface which, that is kind of extended uh, by a sorted map interface and then a navigable map, just like a sorted set you see and a navigable set, a navigable map extends a sorted map and sorted map extends the map interface, right? Okay, so one thing to uh, note over here that this map interface, it is not extending a collection interface like the list queue or a set. It is pretty much, you know, like separate and we would see why it is so. Also, uh, if you see uh, these interfaces, normally we see a class implementing an interface, implementing an interface, right? But if you see the, here is an interface which is extending another interface. So interface extending another interface is very common in Java. And that is basically you can consider it as a class extending another class. So when a class extends another class, what it does is, so whenever a class B extends a super or parent class, that is class A, all the methods of his parent class are now accessible by the child class. And similarly, the inter when an interface, like when a, a child interface extends a parent interface, uh, all the methods that were there in the parent interface 
uh, that would be there in the child interface as well. On top of it, the child interface will add a couple of more methods. So as a result, when a particular class will implement the child interface, it has to implement not only the methods that are there in the parent interface, but also it has to like implement all the methods that are there in the child interface. So these concepts, these are basic concepts of Java. So just in case you don't know, I'm just you know stating these things so that it, you don't get confused as we go further in the video. So now you see that uh, if you want to go to the implementations, so you can see there is this iterable class, then again, the interface extends the iterable, right? And then uh, this uh, collection has an iterator, right? As an iterator interface. And then this there's a list iterator that extends the iterator. We'll see all of this, don't worry. But if you want to see the implementation side of things, let's quickly see the concrete classes part. Uh, so a vector and an adder list uh, implements a list, right? Uh, linked list implements both DQ and a list. Uh, so a priority queue implements a queue and a queue extends a queue, right? And a has set implements a set and linked has set extends a has set. We are, all, we are going to see all of it in action, right? And a tree set implements a navigable set and an array DQ implements a DQ. So now uh, let's see for the map. So for the map, you can see the hash map is an implementation of the map interface and the tree map is an implementation of the navigable map interface. And the linked hash map is also a class that extends a hash map class. We are going to see all of it in action later in the video. Okay, now let's start with iterators. Okay, so uh, let's consider a use case, right? So we will see that why do we need iterators in the first place. So now let's say we have a generic list. We have created our own generic list. So basically, uh, this is not nothing. We are just going to create our own list. And as a result, down uh, behind the scenes, we are going to create a normal array, right? That we are doing here with a size of 100. And we're just maintaining the size of that list, right? So the current size of the list, and we are maintaining an array, right? So in order to like maintain a list, we need to have an underlying data structure, right? So that is basically done by normal array, right? Now, one thing, um, this is basically a generic list. So this T, like I know many of you don't know Java generics, and this is something I would cover. If you if you are interested, I would cover generics in one of my later videos in this series. So do let me know if you want to have like understand generics from very scratch, and I would be more than happy to make a detailed video on it. And I personally feel that under, for understanding collections, uh, you need to understand generics. The generics are the building block. But if I started with making a generics video, trust me, you would, guys wouldn't have watched it. So that is why I started with collections so that at least you can start solving the DSA problems using the framework, uh, collection framework. And also you can like, it is just a quick start, I can just see. But uh, in order to understand collections in depth, because I won't be covering all the methods, right? I mean, I will be covering all the important methods, 99% of the cases, 99.99% of the cases, uh, all this video would suffice. But let's say one or two methods here and there you want to read about, right? Uh, uh, yourself and then you record to the documentation then you would come across these you know uh, generic things of java in collection and then you might get super intimidated right and that is because you don't have an idea about generic programming in java in this video i would be trying to you know give you the basics so that you can follow me along the video but i personally feel that you should know java generics and probably that would be a video for the next topic but i would be actually teaching you java generics from depth and then these things would be a cake for you right so, but for now, don't worry. Uh, I would help you to follow along with me and uh, I would like make you understand the things that you would come across. So that is not going to be a big thing, but yeah, understanding genetics should be a priority once after you're done with collections, right? Because then you would be able to understand things properly. You'd be able to read documentation properly because here what I'm doing is I'm reading the documentations and I'm presenting you to in a format so that you don't have to understand a lot of things in depth. But when you have to go and read, uh, 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 different collections, then you might face issues if you don't know genetics. You won't be able to understand the method signatures and all. And that is why Java genetics are very, very important. People generally don't talk about it. They directly jump to the collections because these type of keywords really sells. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I personally would suggest you to learn Java generics, but not now. After we finish this video, I would come up with a Java generics video from scratch. I would be telling everything about Java genetics, all you need to know. And uh, yeah, you can watch that video and then I think uh, you would be good to go. So whenever we would be trying to instantiate this our uh, generic list, right? Uh, we would be saying that, okay, this is a generic list of integer, or we would be saying that it's our generic list of float or a double, right? So then this T, that is the placeholder, would the compiler would replace it with the type that the user is calling it with. So we would see it in action very soon. So let's say if you want to create this our generic list, right? If you, if just this is, let's say you want to do it with an integer, okay? So let's say this is the list, okay? And let's say new our generic list and that's it, okay? We are done, okay? So whenever you're saying it's an integer, then this T, the compiler will replace this T with an integer, okay? 
uh, normally actually uh, like uh, when the compiler compiles it there's a type to ratio that happens and then this gets converted to object uh, class and all but we are not going too much into depth that i would be covering in the java generics otherwise it would get confused so for now just consider this e is nothing it's just a placeholder for so that it so that java compiler allows any type for this particular class that's it that's it nothing else and just uh, remember this concept because we will be using this a lot throughout the video right and also one more thing since java 1.7 we don't need to put the integer on the on the right hand side so if you see this is the error that is coming so if i change this so that you can see that is not allowed for source level below 1.7 so if you change it the project compliance to 1.7 and above so this see this error is gone so basically before java 1.7 we have to all we had to also you know uh, tell the type over here as well but now if we just provide the type in the left hand side we don't need to provide it on the right hand side okay so that's it okay so now coming back to our code so we have this array of items we have the size right and we have instantiated this items to some like uh, size of 100 let's say and now we are going to have an add method so we can add items right and we can get items okay so now you can see i've added two more methods that is uh the add method and one, one is the get item at index so these are two simple methods you're just adding an item to this items array and you are getting an item right at that particular position okay so this is our own generic list right now let's go back uh, to here and let's add some items right so let's say we add um, one and also let's say we add two let's add three okay cool now let's say we want to iterate over this list and do something right how do we iterate over this list let's say we just use a for loop can we do this no it will give us an error it says can only iterate over an array or an instance of java.lang.iterate we'll come to this but for now we understand that there is a problem we can't like iterate over the list right the reason we can't do this is because if you go to this class we don't have access to this array, right? We don't have access to this array. So now one thing you can say, make this items array public and then we can access it from outside. The client can uh, access it from the from here, right? Like list dot items. But that violates the OOPS principles, that violates the encapsulation principle uh, because, you know, one, one concern is that using this items, right? We can like set or we can change the contents of the array from the outside, which is actually a very uh, bad thing to do. And also let's say, Today, we are using an array, a generic uh, normal array, you know, to uh, like uh, like maintain all this generic list class. Next day, if I want to change the implementation details, I want to change it to an array list, right? Then this particular code, the client code will fail because uh, one simple reason is an array list. In order to get one element uh, at a particular place, you, you use the dot get method, but for an array, you don't have that, right? So basically, the crust is that this our generic list class I should only expose the functionalities. I should not be exposing uh, my implementation details, my internal implementation details, because I can change it the way I want, but that should not affect my client's code, right? Because that is very, very important. So that is why I really can't you know, make it public. That would be a very bad thing to do. So now the question is that how can I now iterate over this list? There needs to be some way so that I can iterate over this list. And to help us with that, our friend iterable interface comes in. So now what we have to do is we have to implement this iterable interface, right? That basically says that, hey, this class is an iterable. That means you can use a for loop to iterate over this class sequentially or an object of this class sequentially. So now it gives an error. This error is because we have to implement the methods of the iterable. And you see that this method basically returns an iterator. So once you implement an iterable, you should, you should implement a method of this class that is an iterator, which basically is nothing but gives you an iterator back to your client and your client can use that iterator to iterate over the collection, right? Or the list, whatever is it. So now let's look at the iterator interface, like what exactly this is, right? Because we have to return, return an object that implements this interface. So we have to understand what exactly it is. So this iterator basically is an interface and it has three important methods. One is has next and next, right? Two important methods, sorry. So these two methods must be implemented, right? So whichever class implements that interface, right? They should implement these two methods. Now has next method basically tells you that whether there is any item left in this collection, right? There is any item left in this collection uh, or in this class. And next is basically give me 
the next element in this collection or list, whatever is it. I will say collection because a list is one part of collection. There would be other types of collection as well. Now, so now we understand we have to return an object that implements this iterator and implements the, to those two methods that is next and has next. So what we do is we create a class, a private class, my or our generic list iterator. This is a class that implements that implements the iterator this iterator class right because that is important and it should be of object of type t right and i will tell you why i made this private i made this class private because see this is an internal implementation of this thing this iterator belongs to this class so i i really don't want this class to be exposed uh, my client doesn't need to know that how am i exposing my iterators right my client should get the iterator that's it it doesn't need access to the class and that's why I'm making it an inner class and also a private class okay so again there's an error so it has to add the it has to implement the two methods that is has next and next right so how do we do it so to iterate over this you know list right we need to have an instance of this object right so that's why we would have an instance of this object of uh, type t right and we call it list okay now inside the constructor, we we'll just pass this list and uh, yeah, so we will just pass this list. So this dot list is list, right? And here, what are we do? What we are going to do is, uh, how do we understand that whether uh, it, it still has elements, right? So we are going to maintain an index, right? So this index would be helpful. Uh, so we, since we, we would be uh, accessing sequentially, so this index would tell us that, hey, uh, where our current index lies. So let's say I say, give me the next element. So index would initially be at zero, right? So it gives, it will give you the element at position zero and then the index will move on to position one. So next time I can call the next, it would give me the element at that index one and it will move on to index two. We'll see that in action, right? But first let us see the has next in action. So Let's term it as int index. And what we would do is you will just check that if uh, return, this has to be a boolean. So return index less than um, list.size. That's it. Okay. Cool. And for the next, what we will do is return uh, list dot items. Here we are accessing the inner uh, attributes of the uh, of this particular class, but that's fine. That's absolutely fine because this class is a private class of this class. Right, so that is why we can access the private methods, right? And there is no harm in doing it, right? Because this class is a part of the this class, right? This this iterator class is a part of this class, so that is why it is fine to access uh, the inner attributes of these of these classes, and th therefore doesn't violate any principles, right? Okay, so list of items, uh, and then we do an index plus plus see i'm i'm like writing our own iterator functions and all these things very few few people will actually tell you these things uh but the reason i'm telling you because you are learning a lot of things as well like you're learning the importance of private class why iterator is coming why iterable is coming into the picture because once you understand these concepts from very scratch you would be able to remember the concepts right and you would be actually able to appreciate that why these things are happening that is why i'm teaching you in such a way otherwise i would have just you know tell, told you hey this is an iterable collection has exposed method and you know i could have done it you know uh, very shallow way but i'm not doing that right and and the reason you would figure out on your own while you get started with uh, collections anyway so list of items index plus plus so basically what it is doing is it is it is checking that okay give me the current index like give me the item at this current index and then once we return it uh increase the index right so basically it is like this only so this can could have been written, written as int item equals to list of items index right and index plus plus and return item that's what it is so this this three lines of code i have written in one line over here right so that's the thing so let's comment this out okay and now let's see how can we uh okay so now here we have to return uh, return an object of this class so return new our generic list iterator and we will pass this object this is this particular object that is an instance of this class right cool i think we are done now let's try to iterate over this class. Now, how will we iterate over this class? So now let's get the iterator of this uh, list, 
right? So we can traverse over it. So iterator of integer, right? Since it's this this array list or uh, this generic list is of integer type, um, iterator is equals to this. Now we'll use the next and the has next method that we wrote over here, right? To so basically this will return an object of this type, right? And we would use the next and the has next method to uh, iterate. So let's import this java dot util and while iterator dot has next system dot out dot println iterator dot next so that will simply return me the uh, the object one by one till we are not running out of the elements so let's run this and let's see okay so there was this one error over here which i missed uh, this is not a function this is an uh, like uh, an attribute so let's fix this and now let's run our code um, okay, so you see that printed the list one, two, three, that printed the elements of the list one, two, three, one by one, right? So you can understand how iterator is helping us. Now, I would show you a fun trick. Okay, so all this code that we wrote, like taking the iterator, then you know, traversing it one by one, this is a bit verbose, and we can sugarcoat it using one line of code. You can just comment it down, right? And using one line of code, using the for each loop, uh, we can write it like this. And this is going to do the same thing. Okay, this basically is going to do the same thing. Like these three lines of code, basically the compiler will convert this piece of code into this piece of code, right? And to show you and to prove you that, that they're going to call the has next method and the next method, I'm going to also do a print here as well so that you understand and you can actually follow that, hey, this is actually happening. So I will just say has next called and here I will just write this out, you know, next call. Okay. So now you can see I have like uh, added a debugger over here and have uh, like uh, commented out this piece of code. And I'm just using a for loop. Now you will see the has next and the next method calls would be happening behind the scenes. So let's see. You see, has next called, then the next was called, then one. So you see again, this has next was called. It was the element was there, then the next was called, then two, and then again the has next was called, then and then the element was there, then since the next was called, and then three was printed, and then again has next was called, no element was found, and therefore the next was not called, and it came out of the while loop. So you don't have to write these lines of code. This for each loop would suffice, right? So whenever you see a for each loop while traversing an array list or linked list behind the scenes, these things actually happen, and that is what an iterator and iterable is. So to sum up things. Uh, a class which implements an iterable, you can use a for each loop to traverse that particular collection, right, or that particular class or instance of that class, right. And if you are implementing an iterable, you have to implement this iterator method mandatorily. And this iterator will give you an instance of a class that implements the iterator uh, interface, which in turn has these two methods next and has next, right. Cool. Now you don't need to worry too much about uh, these things. You just need to know these things because the collection framework and all the implementations of the collection has these things in store for you. It's just for you to understand the internal implementations. If this sounds too heavy for you, don't worry, you can rewatch this part again. But trust me, it's fine. You don't need to remember so many things because as I said, collection framework, all the classes in the collection framework has these things done and done for you. So basically you just use the for each loop to traverse to the collections, okay? Let's get back to the, you know, the core interface picture, right? You see the top of this chain, we had the iterable interface and we are done with this. We are now understand what, is, what an iterable is. And now we understand that why the collection interface extends the iterable interface. Because a collection interface wants the, all the classes implementing that interface to actually implement the methods of iterable interface. That means a collection wants to say that, hey, if you are implementing my interface, that means if you are calling yourself a collection then you have to implement the iterable interface that is very important because a collection is saying that i am iterable that is basically what it is meaning in layman terms and that is the reason a collection interface extends the interface or uh, the iterable interface right so that in turn when an other classes are implementing the collection interface it also has to implement the methods of the iterable interface right so that would make those classes iterable. So basically, if you are extending or you are implementing uh, a collection interface, you have to implement iterable interface. That basically means every collection out there is iterable. 
And I will tell you one fun fact, maybe we are going to cover that later in the video. You see, map is not extending or implementing our collection. So that map is not iterable, right? So now how do you iterate a map? That is something we would see later in the video when we touch on maps and why map is not a collection. We'll also see that. But for now, we can understand that, okay, since collection is an implement, extending and iterable, so that means a list that extends a collection, a queue that extends a collection, a set uh, is, is extending a collection, they're all iterable. That means you can all use a for each loop to traverse through these collections. So if this is clear to you, now let's start with the next part of the video. So now let's look at, do a deep dive into the collection framework. So now you can see a collection interface, it contains a couple of methods that you have to implement if you are saying that, hey, I am a collection, right? Or I'm implementing a collection interface. One is the contains all, one is the add all, one is the remove all, return all, and clear, right? So clear is basically clearing the collections, emptying the collections, and we are going to see all the methods in action later, but just keep this in mind. We will see once we uh, start with the concrete implementation of a collection, uh, you will see these methods in action, okay? So we are done with iterable, we are done with collection. Now let's start with list, right? So let's see what is a list. List basically are collections that maintains the elements in order, right? And they can contain duplicates. In order, I mean the order of insertion, the order in which you insert the elements, that way you would get the elements while you would be traversing, right? The same order. And they are position based. That means uh, you can uh, like access those elements using the position and it follows zero based indexing. That is the first position is zero. That's just like arrays. Let's take a look at the list methods that you have. So this E, don't get confused by it. It is just a return type and return type as in like it can be of any type, okay? So similar to the T that we saw in our, our own generic list, this is just a placeholder for the any generic type. That's it, okay? So these are the methods that we have, get, set, add, add all, and remove. We are going to see all of this in action. Okay, so we are going to touch upon all of these methods very soon, don't worry. So now let's take a quick look at the implementations of the list. So the three implementations of the list interface are providing the Java util package and they are array list, link list, and vector. Okay, so yeah, vector class is also there in Java. We are used to seeing vectors in C++, but yeah, also in Java you have vectors and we are going to see the difference between vectors and array and which one we generally do use and why do we use it, right? I'm going to cover all of that. Okay. So what is an array list? Let's understand this. So array list is a dynamic array, right? And it is to be used when we don't know the size of the array, right? Let's take an example. So let's say I give you a question. There's a DSI question, right? They're asked to find out all the prime numbers between one to thousand, right? And you have to return it in the form of an array. So tell now, tell me one thing that in order to find out the prime numbers between one to thousand, you have to store it in the array. That's pretty simple. I told you in the, in the starting of the question that yeah, you have to like return it in the form of an array. But tell me, how would you define the size of the array? Because when, when you would be declaring that array, right, you have to declare the size of that array as well beforehand. But do you know that how many prime numbers do exist? Do you know that beforehand, before you actually start computing or filling the elements into the array? No, you don't know, right? So now here you will say a work around this is, Basically, you would create an array of arbitrary size of a large size, and then you would start filling that array from the start, right, from zero index. But in that case, if you take a very, very large number, then don't you think you'd be ending up wasting a lot of space, right? Second is, let's say you take a number, right, you take a guess, but the number of prime numbers are greater than that. Then you would run into an exception, you would run into an error, because you won't have, you would run into an array index out of bounds exception, right? So in order to help you with these things, where you pre, where you don't know the size of the array, what it can be beforehand, array list comes into the picture because in array list, you don't need to specify the size. Yeah, you can do that if you are very sure that, okay, this is going to be the size of the array. But if you don't know beforehand, that is absolutely fine. So I would tell you now what array list exactly does, right? So array list internally it uses a normal array, right? And it creates a normal array set to some default capacity. So basically it will create a normal array of some default capacity size. You can also define the size uh, using the constructor that we're going to see, but normally generally we don't do it, right? Now when the capacity is reached, let's say we take an array of 10 elements and those 10 elements are filled up and we want to insert the 11th element. Then what happens, it will create a new array of bigger size. Normally it is 50% of the current capacity and it then copies all the elements from the old array to the new array. And then the new address reference is used for the internal usage. So now instead of 10, you have 15, 20 elements, right? And all the 10 old elements are copied. The 11th element is inserted and the old array is no longer in use. So it will be garbage collected and it is gone. So now you're using the new array of bigger size. And in this way, the array is dynamically grows in size, right? So all of this internal implementation is done in an array list. Now I can make a separate video where I can show you that how array list is implemented internally. But that if you want such a video, do comment down below. But for this video, 
like this is the internal working of an array list and it's very similar to vectors right in c++ again don't confuse vectors of c++ and vectors in java right do what both do both are different anyway this is an array list right an array list basically implements the list interface it implements the list interface because array list is a list right that is why it implements the list interface the vector class also implements the list interface but let's see the what is the difference right so the difference basically is both use dynamically resizable arrays uh, providing first random access that is position based access and first list traversal that is very much it is very much like an uh, ordinary array it uses an ordinary array right in, in the behind the scenes but the vector class is thread safe right and this unlike the array list class and what do i mean by thread safe it means the concurrent calls to the vector will not compromise its integrity so don't get too much into it this will be covered in the multi threading part of the video where i will be covering later not in this video but really you don't need to get in the concurrent side of things here and in, even in dsc you won't need this so vector class just know this exists but it is like pretty much uh, don't need to know array list knowing array list is okay array list and vector classes almost provide a comparable performance but vector sluffers a slight performance penalty because of this thread set things and synchronization and all these things right so that is why array list is preferred and we would be using array list okay uh, in our uh, most 99.9% .9 of the dsa solutions that we will be writing okay and then we have a linked list so linked list is also implements a list but it also implements other interfaces as well uh, we will come to that later so the linked list basically uses a doubly linked list uh, i'm not going to explain too much what a linked list is i guess you might be already knowing that otherwise it be a huge digression if i start explaining linked list and the insertions and deletions in a doubly linked list are very efficient right so let's compare an array list versus linked list so this is a very very important question guys you would be getting asked an array list versus linked list multiple times in every java interview so that's why i'm covering this and you should also know why when you should use what right so array list versus linked list is very similar to comparing an array versus a linked list right and i am very sure you already know that what is an array and what is a well, what is the difference between array and linked list right so whenever tells whenever someone tells you that explain me the difference between array list and a linked list you can think of it as an array versus linked list because an array list uses an array in behind the scenes so first of all array list supports position based access linked list also does that but since an array list maintains an array the like getting up element at a particular index is constant time but for linked list you have to traverse right you can't directly access you can't randomly access that particular position you have to traverse to that position as a result it can be linear time right so that is why position based access has constant time performance of the array list but for the linked list it can be uh, linear now let's say when we want to frequently insert and delete inside a list then linked list is a better choice why it is because uh, you can do that in constant time with the help of pointers but in case of an array list if you want to insert a particular element you have to shift the elements and that can take you a linear time right so whenever there is a frequent insertions and deletions occurring within the linked list always uh, inside a list always you consider using a linked list overall array list is the best choice so whenever we are using list we would be using array list right so that is one hack i would give you we would be only using linked list when you using layer stacks use later in the video we will see that but whenever there is a concept of arrays or whenever there is a concept of list so we would be totally totally using array list that's it May, let's make things simple for you okay and as i said in addition to the list interface the linked list also implements the dequeue interface uh, that allow it to be used for stacks and different kinds of queues which we are going to cover in the later part of the video but yeah uh, array list only implements a list but a linked list implements a list a dequeue as well now let's quickly jump into the array list code and see array list in action a lot of theory i know it has been covered so now let's create a array list okay so i'm going to comment this out and i'm going to create an array list so you always want to code against the interfaces right so that is the best practice always so that is why since array list implements a list i am going to store a reference of the array list object inside a list okay and we will implement we will like uh, import the list from java.util and this is the array list we will create this array list okay and we will we will just add elements cool so let's add the elements one by one and let's import the array list from java.util cool okay so again as you can understand add method simply as the array list uh, okay and also we can iterate over this list right also we can directly print out this array list okay so let's do that only let's this out array list and we can do this because obviously uh, we know that the two string method of this class is implemented of the array list is obviously implemented and that's why we can do that so let's print this out by the way if you have any doubts comment down below and i would be more than happy to resolve it uh okay so you can see that one two three got printed that means the array list got printed so you can add elements like that 
Now let's say we want to change a particular element. Like let's say we want to change this element at position one, right? So we use a set for that, and we let's say at position one we want to change it to hundred, so it would be changed. And this set um, uh, function or set method basically returns you the uh, element, the previous element that got changed. So basically two got changed to hundred, so this will return two. Although you don't really need to do that, uh, know that because it is not of any use. But just in case we want to use it, it's better to know. So I will just print it. So let's say element that got replaced is equals to this. Okay. So let's quickly, yeah, good. And yeah, let's run this. So you will see the element that got replaced is 2 because 2 was at position 1 and now the new array has been changed to array list has been changed to 103. Okay, now let's create another array list and I'm going to show you a very interesting thing. So let's create an array list 2. We're going to create a new array list. But let's say that we want to create this ALST2, the new array list, from the previous array list. Or basically, we want to create a copy of this array list. So, one way of doing this is like going through these elements one by one using the for each loop because it's an iterable and adding the elements ALST2.add the elements, right? But um, we can do this in one line. So, basically, this array list class takes in a constructor where you can pass any collection. So, since array list is also a collection, so we can pass um, this a list and now if you just print this a list 2 you would see okay there's an error uh, over here okay cool now let's print this you would see the like this element has been copied right uh, now if you want to add elements to this you can also add right so add you know 4 and you can and then if you want to print all both the array list let's print both the array list so now let's run the code so you see this array list as one, two, three. We then made a copy of this particular array list, and then we added four to this, right? And also, uh, please note that this this second array list was created as a copy. So whenever we are adding a new element, that is not getting added to the first array list, right? So that's why I printed both these array lists. So this is one thing. Second is you can pass an array list over here. You can pass basically any collection, right? Any collection. You can also pass in a set. You can pass in any anything that implements a collection. So here I just took an example of an array list, right? So if you want to create, co create a copy of address, you can do like this using the constructor. Okay, one more thing I want to show you here. Now this is the concept of generics. It's not a concept of collection, but still, uh, instead of this integer, you're writing that, you're seeing that I am writing this integer with the capital I. I'm not writing like this. You see, this will give an error, right? This will give an error because it says that you have to come, you have to pass a reference type, right? So in generics, since uh, the compiler like transforms this internally into an object type, right? Uh, so, and since object is a reference type, we need to pass or the generics only allow ty reference types as parameters. Now, I know this might sound a little bit complex to you. So to make things easy for you, let's just think in this way that we can only, whenever we are working with collections, because collections are generic types, right? Generic classes or generic interfaces, Whenever we would be working with collections or any generic interfaces or classes, we always have to pass references, right? Now, to make things easy for you, what Java has done is like int, float, double, these are primitive types, okay? There exist reference types for every primitive types out there. So for int, there exists integer. For, you know, let's say double primitive type, there exists this double class. For float, there exists capital float. So the first letter is capital, that's it. You get converted in this corresponding reference type and now you can use it in collection, right? So this basically is called a wrapper class. So you can read about it. There's nothing much about it. And there's also a concept of boxing unboxing. Uh, so basically what happens is, let's say here, you see that this iterator, like this, this next method, because you see when this is called, this next method is returning an element and that is getting captured over here, right? So this, this uh, iterator is returning you a type of integer, right? But here we are using the small int. So we are using the primitive type. I mean, the compiler does this thing for you. So whenever a compiler sees that you have a reference type of integer, capital integer, and you want to store it in a primitive type integer, that conversion is automatically taken care of by the compiler. And that is what is called unboxing, right? So this is concept of unboxing bo uh, boxing that you can like probably uh, go and read about it. But for now, don't get too much confused about it, right? Cool. Okay, so there is another one method which I wanted to cover. So let's say now we have, uh, let's take this list only and let's say we create a new array list. And let's say we have, we are adding four. We are adding, let's say, alst2.add 
5 lst2 dot add 6 okay now we uh, so this is the array list right we have added 4 5 6 okay now let's do one thing let's uh, comment down this line of code and also let's comment down these two lines of code and now let's say you want to add all the items of this particular the first array list to this second array list after this you have added uh, the 4 5 6 right then there's a method uh, called add on so basically here the uh, initially what we are doing is we are creating a copy of the array list using the constructors but here we are not necessarily creating a copy we have certain elements in array list and after having all those elements we want to add all the elements of the other array list right and for that there's a method called add all so add all right and again it takes a collection right so here since array list is also a collection so we are taking we are passing this alst so basically what it will do it will simply add all the elements of this a list to this a list second array list after this six so just print it i will just print it and you uh, you would see what is exactly happening so you see we had initially at four five six and then after six one two three got added and again this is a very useful method that you would be using a lot while you will be solving dsa problems there is also a couple of methods like uh index of like see there are a lot of methods and you can any time go and read the documentations of the of the java oracle docs but uh, i'm going to cover the important methods right that you would be reading uh, needing in day to day action so there's this index of methods which will give you the index of a particular element so let's say uh, that uh, okay so let's, let's say you want to find the index of 2 so 2 is at index 1 right so you, so you see 2 is at index 1 so that is why one dot printed right one more thing just want to sh wanted to show you this index of method what does it take it takes a method of object so ideally uh, we can't pass a primitive type. So ideally, we should have passed an integer like this. Right? Uh, we should have passed an integer like this. Okay. Yeah. But we don't need to do this because, as I said, instead of, if you just directly pass 2, the compiler will automatically compile it to new integer. Like, it will automatically create the wrapper class for this particular integer class. So these things, you really don't need to bother. bother. These things are taken care behind scenes. And this is what boxing and auto unboxing are. Also, there is a method last index of so basically when you have multiple elements let's say again you have like let's say i want to again add this element to right so in this here instead of if you use the last index of element it will now return because since two last was found at this third index so it will print three so you see this print three is printed okay so now also there's a method called sublist so let's quickly look into that so sublist is basically it will chunk in array list it will slice an array list right so let's say now we want to create a uh, new array list, let's say alst3 is equals to alst2 dot sublist and we want it from index 1 to index 4, right? And we want to print this alst3, okay? So what will happen is right now alst2, ALST2 has 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, right? That, that's what it has, right? And now we want to like take a sublist from 1, that is from 5, to index 4 that is this is like 1 2 3 and this is 4 but it won't take 2 because this is exclusive this index is exclusive it is not inclusive this part is from index is inclusive but two index is exclusive right so it will print it this list will have a list 3 will print 5 6 1 right so let's quickly jump into this and let's see the let's run this and you can see 5 6 1 and 2 is not printed or 2 is not added to the list because this two list uh, parameter is excluded okay now one interesting thing Let's say if we now want to make some changes to this ALS3, ALS3. Let's say we want to set the first element of this sublist to 100. Okay. And then if we print ALS3, obviously we understand that now the sublist instead of like uh, 561, it will be 1061, right? But let's also print the ALS2. I think it's already printed, so we don't need to print it separately. Yeah, let's see what happens. Let's see the magic. So see that 100 got changed in the sub list, but also it changed the main list as well. It also changed the, so you see 100 being changed in both the list. So that shows that be very, very when you are using the sub list function, because sub list function, unlike the constructor that we used to make a copy of the array list, it doesn't create a copy of the array list, right? So it gives you a view, but if you make changes to the view, if you make changes to this uh, array list that you, get uh, from the sublist method if you change that array list the underlying array list from which you did a sublist of them will also get changed it will also change its contents contents as well 
So this is shallow copy that has been done over here. So, so be very, very while using this sublist method. If you want to make changes to this error list, please know that underlying error list will also, the contents of the underlying error list will also get changed, right? So these are very common mistakes that happens and uh, while solving DSA problems, we just can't get our head around it and that's because we don't have our idea or uh, we don't have the concepts clear, right? That's why. A logic may be fine, but just because we don't know these internal things or internal workings, we land up in errors, right? So sublist method, always remember, it's not a deep copy, it's a copy of reference. So if you're changing to the uh, contents of this sublist, uh, then the underlying, the main list contents will also get changed. Okay, so we are done with our list. Now quickly jump into something what we call as a list iterator. So let's first go into the picture and see what uh, what we have covered so far. So let's look at this picture. So we have covered iterables. We have covered collections, collection extends an iterable. We covered an uh, list, right, which implements, uh, which ex again extends a collection. A list is an interface. And then we covered vectors, array list, and linked list. Linked list we are yet to cover, but at least vectors and array list, those are country classes which actually implements the list interface. Uh, and we have covered that and now list interface contains something called a list iterator right and what is a list iterator a list iterator you can see extends an iterator right so list iterator is also an interface but it extends the iterator interface right so since it extends the iterator interface obviously it is going to contain the next method has next method but what else does it contain and why do we need a list iterator in the first place let's jump into that now so you can see this list iterator is an interface that extends an iterator so this has next method and next method obviously it is it is going to have from the previous iterator interface that it is extending and on top of that it has a has previous and the previous method right and it provides two methods that is the list iterator and uh, again another method an overloaded method where you can also specify the index and from that index it will give you the iterator right so basically the iterator from the first method that is this method it will help you to traverse the element consecutively starting from the first element right and while this method basically it traverses the list indicated by the specified index it starts from that specified index now why do we have these two methods let's see into, let's see that so basically the list iterator interface is a bi-directional iterator for list now we know that linked list it uses a w linked list right so linked list also implements the uh, list right and we know that since linked list uses a w linked list you can like traverse by direction in the linked list, right? If you have studied linked list, you would be knowing, especially if it's a doubly linked list, right? So that is why you are provided this list iterator interface so that you can bi-directionally traverse. Now, in case of using an array list, don't use it. But whenever you, use, you are using a linked list, feel free to use this list iterator interface because you would you might require to you know, traverse by direction. So it extends the iterator interface. This basically this iterator extends the iterator interface and it allows the list to be traversed in either directions using the next and the previous so again uh, this is like this is basically something we would use in in a linked list right so let's look into the linked list a little bit uh what it is so linked list basically since it implements the list so you will have these add methods you will have these add all methods you will have the set methods so these will be there and why it will be there like all the methods that you have in the array list that will be there in the linked list as well right and the reason you know why the reason is both implement a list and these are methods of list or, or collections right List interface extends a collection. So all the methods of collection interface, you have to implement it if you are implementing a list, right? Because the list extends a collection, right? And then list has some methods on top of it, like this, uh, like this set methods and all, right? So so an array list implements a li uh, list interface, and linked list also implements a list interface, right? So both has the same set of methods. So whatever uh, methods you have in array list, you will get in linked list. So that's the beauty of it. You don't need to remember like separate methods. Oh, array list, then uh, these are the methods. Okay, I need to know. Oh, it's a linked list, then these are the methods you don't need to know. No, that's why interface comes into the picture. You know that, okay, array list and linked list, both implement the list interface. So just remember the methods of the list interface and you're done. The, you don't need to remember separately the, uh, in, uh, the, 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 the methods of array list and linked list separately. So even a linked list, so just show in action, so again, we will take a linked list, linked list of interior, let's say, and LK. I'm giving bad names, by the way, I'm not following the naming conventions because that is not in the scope of this video. So don't mind me using bad variables. We'll just implement a new list. Since we always code against interfaces, so that's why I changed this to list. Um, now we can add elements, like we can do the same, which we were doing in, you know, uh, in the error list, right? And since uh, also we can iterate using a for each loop, right? Um, now, 
there's something called list iterator which I just showed you and this will give me a list iterator okay you can also have a list iterator in ArrayList but in ArrayList we don't really require it to you know uh, like do bidirectional traversal so that is the reason we generally don't use it uh, but in linked list we might require and that's why I'm showing you in context of a linked list right so yeah so by uh, so that is what that is an iterator okay and uh, yeah so sorry this is not a list iterator this is a list iterator of end user cool and let's see what is there oh, we need to implement it yeah we need to import it cool okay so now let's quickly check one thing over here so let's say we want to print the first element that is iterator dot next okay and then iterator dot next again so you can understand that one is going to get printed then two is going to get printed okay so right now we have like this okay now when we are printing iterator dot print what is going to be printed you might expect one to get printed right no no one won't get printed so let's see what happens let's get surprised Okay, I think we just need to comment out a few things. Um, I think we are printing a couple of things, so that might confuse you a bit. So let's comment all these things down. Yeah, now let's print this. So that we only ensure the printing what we require. Okay, oh sorry, I think this should have been next. That's why it was coming as true. Now let's do this. Okay, see. So initially, the pointer was at one. So you called next. So it returned, we implemented the next, remember, right? So it returned me the one and then the index got to two right now we again call next so it returned you the two and it moved the cursor moved to three like the on the pointer right the index pointer that we used right while we were implementing the iterator and now you will understand why i actually showed you implementing an iterator now you'll be able to relate more better now when we call previous previous does a little bit slightly different thing okay so what a previous does is previous will first move the pointer it will first move the pointer so with like what the next was doing is it it was returning the current element and then it was moving to the next position. Like let's say if you are called next year, then it would have returned three first and then it would have moved to the next position. But what brief does is it first moves, it first moves back, right? It first moves back, right? And then it returns the element. So that is why it was the cursor was, was a three, right? And now it moves first to two and then it returns two. No, no. So now again, if we call brief, what happens is it will first move to one and then it will return one. Simple. So basically, if you want to know the internal implementation, it is something like this. For next, we were doing something like we just saw that we were we would we were doing return items of index plus plus. That means this is a postfix, right? So that means first return me the index at that particular position and then increment the index pointer pointer. But for previous, this would be something like return items first. This is a prefix, first decrement, first decrement the index. And then return the element something like this is implemented behind the scenes so that this is something i wanted to cover otherwise if you would have been using the next and previous you might have got confused right so anyway that's that's it about linked list i think in linked list you don't have anything to know in fancy linked list basically internet it uses a double linked list and let's see what does a linked list does so linked list basically it implements a list and it also implements a dq as just as i told you right so array list just implements a list, but a uh, linked list implements a DQ along with a list. And we would see what DQ is, right, in action very soon when we read about queues, okay? So yeah, I think for now linked list, I think if you know this is fine. But normally, whenever we are using any sort of uh, data structure that requires us an array, we would use an array list. We don't, we won't require linked list. When we require linked list, we would, I would show you that. But whenever it's an array, Whenever you're solving a DSA question where you require a list or you require an array, you just go for an array list. Simple as that. Nothing else is required. Okay. When do we require a linked list? I will show you. Okay. Okay, cool. Now let's quickly jump on to we are done with list iterators as well. Sometimes now what happens is if you solve lead code questions, sometimes uh, the lead code functions, they ask you to return in the form of an array. So let's say they give there is this question uh, which we just talked about that return me the set of time numbers from 1 to 1000, right? 
and so basically as i as we just discussed we would be using a uh, an array list to store the prime numbers between 1 to 1000 because we don't know the size beforehand that what would be the total number of prime numbers between 1 to 1000 right that's why you would be using an array list but now when we want to return we see the function signature asks us to return in the form of a normal array in case you want to convert an array list to an array you, and, you, and, you, and you might require it a lot of times in action i have used it a lot in in v code especially so this is the method that would be your friend so let's comment out this piece of code and let's comment again uncomment this part okay this part is already uncommented so let's take this line so let's take this a list so it has one two three two right and if you want to convert this into an array what you need to do is this is method all to array and you have to pass like you have to pass an array right and you can pass it of any size you really don't need to worry so basically you have to pass an array as a parameter to this to array function and and you have to also like what would be the size of the array that you'll be passing right so it can be of any size by convention we pass zero right and it returns me an integer array that is ERR. okay so this is basically of integer type yeah cool and now you can just traverse through this array print out x one by one and you will see that this array list has been converted to an array so just print it out quickly see one two three two has been printed okay cool uh okay so a little bit about more about this parameter right so as i said you can pass any any size right you can like pass this array of any size so let's say if you pass the size exactly equivalent to the size of this array list then it is fine then it's well and good right so now if you pass an array whose size is greater than the size of the array list what happens is the uh, like the elements of this array list is copied into this array and the other remaining parts is there as null that is not a good convention because you're wasting space and if you are passing an uh, array of whose size is less than than this array list size in this case what we are doing is exactly we are passing zero then a new array is being created whose size is exactly equivalent to this array list of size so we are doing exactly that so you're passing zero that means our size array size was less than uh, this array list size and therefore new array was getting created equivalent to this array list size so you really don't need to bother what is going on behind the scenes uh, just pass any size but i would say i would recommend and i've seen most people doing this they pass zero and you can let this you can trust this two array method to take care of of, of the implementation and uh, one more thing this would be a primitive data type otherwise this will run into error right so it cannot be of n type and here the unboxing auto boxing offers unboxing offers where automatically the compiler understands that okay this is the wrapper class and this is the primitive integer right so i will automatically do the conversion so you don't need to worry about it i will highly recommend you to read about the wrapper class right because this is going to be very very important as you go forward okay so now let's get let's get back to this picture again and let's see where are we so we have just done list iterators we are done with uh, the vectors and array list uh, we would see linked list what it is right so now let's move on to the next part that is the queue interface so as you can see just like list interface queue interface also extends a, a collection interface so queue is also a collection and a DQ is an interface that extends a Q interface, right? So what is a DQ? We will see that. And now you see that, you know, DQ, a linked list, as I said, is implementing a DQ. Array DQ is another method, uh, a, a complete class that implements uh, the DQ interface. And priority Q, it just implements the Q interface. It doesn't implement the DQ interface, right? So let's see what is exactly a Q and what do we need it. And let's deep dive into the Q interface right now. So as I said, a Q interface extends the collection interface. It has the following two methods for adding that one is the adding and one is the offering. So both methods insert the specified element in the queue. The return value indicates the success or failure of the operation, right? That is true or false. Uh, that is why it's Boolean. The add method inherited from the collection interface throws an illegal state exception if the queue is full, but the offer method does not. So that is why we should always use offer just in case we don't want to run into any unwanted exception, right? So offer is always the method that I personally prefer. Similarly for removing, you have pull and remove. So both are used to remove elements, but the only difference is the poll method doesn't show any no such element exception and returns null just in case if you are not able to, there's, there's, uh, the, the queue is empty and uh, we have run out of items, but the remove will throw an exception. So that is why again, I personally prefer offer to add elements and poll to remove elements and that is probably normally what people prefer. And now 
to find out that what is the element that is there at the top of the queue, right? What is the current element? Uh, there are again two methods like uh, peak and element. So peak is the method that we should use because it doesn't throw exception just in case if there is no key, the key, key, just in case if there is no item in the queue at all and we are calling the peak method, it returns null. But in case of an element, if we call that element and there is no items in the queue, then it will throw an exception. So it's always better to use the peak for getting the current element, uh, the pull for pulling items in the queue by removing items from the queue and the offer to add, like you're offering items to the queue, right? So this is the queue interface and anyone, any class that will be implementing or extending the queue interface have to implement these methods, right? So now let's look at, take a look at the implementations of the queue. So both the priority queue and the linked list classes implement the queue interface, right? Actually the linked list uh, like implements the DQ interface and the DQ interface in turn extends the queue interface. So you can say that yeah, linked list is also kind of a queue, right? Okay, now let's take a look at what DQ is. So DQ is an interface that extends the queue interface to allow double-ended queues. So I'm very sure you must be knowing queues. I'm not going too much into depth. So queue is something that follows a last in fast out uh, approach, right? So you, whenever you are adding an element to the queue, it is inserted at the last and when you're removing element from the uh, queue, it is being uh, taken out from the first, right? From the top of the queue, from the front of the queue, right? So a DQ interface extends the queue interface so that you can allow double-ended operations. That means it allows operations not just at its head, but also its tail. So the elements can be inserted or removed from either end, right? So it can be used as a FIFO queue, right? Uh, where, you know, the element which is first going in will be first getting out of the queue. And it can also be used as a stack, which is basically a LIFO ordering. That means the, the element which was inserted last, it would be coming out first, right? So in Java, uh, initially we, had, we didn't have any stack uh, class. Now we have a stack class, uh, which extends the vector uh, class, but you can like in order to use a stack what i would suggest is you can use this dq right because since it allows double ended operations on the queue so you can use both as a fifo or a defo like a stack and fifo is basically dq in order to use a stack i would suggest you to use the use a dq right and not use a normal queue you can also use a dq but also can also use a linked list as well right because linked list since it implements a queue you can get all the vanilla queue operations using a linked list right you can also use a dq as well right and in case you want to use a stack, then you have to fall with uh, the DQ, right? We will see all of this in action if just in case it's so heavy for you. So you can see in the DQ, you have a couple of elements. So we have the offer first and the offer last. That means it is adding elements to the first and last. Then we have a push and we have an add first. So that is like pretty similar to the offer first and you know the difference already. So I'm not covering it. And you also have an add last, right? And the push and the add first methods are like pretty similar. They are similar, right? Um, Similarly, for removing, uh, we ideally should use the poll first and the poll last method, right? Instead of using the pop method or the remove first or the remove last method, right? And for examining, we should use the peak first method or the peak last method instead of using the get first and the get last. And you already know the reason because we don't want to run into an exception. So the array DQ and the linked list class implement the DQ interface. So there are two classes that implement this DQ interface because there needs to be some concrete classes, right? You can't use a DQ like that uh, because DQ is an interface, but you need a concrete implementation of this DQ interface. So the array DQ is a concrete implementation of the DQ as well as a linked list is also an implementation of the DQ interface. So whenever, now please note this down, whenever you want to use FIFO order, that is whenever you want to use something like a first in first out, that is stacks. Array DQ is always the class to go. So array DQ is also iterable and the traversal is always from its head to its tail. And also DQs are not list. So they cannot be randomly accessed based on their positions, right? As key can do in list. Also, they cannot be sorted. So please note this in mind. And array DQ or DQ is something that we saw while we were doing the 01 BFS question in graph series. So go and go and check out that video, right? And you will have an actual understanding of the implementations. But using these methods, right? So using these methods, we can actually implement an array DQ that I just showed you and we are going to do our demo as well. So please remember, whenever we need a normal queue, we would use what? You would use a linked list. Whenever you need a stack, we would use array, array DQ, right? There's also a class called stack as well, which you can use, but I'm not going to show that in the video. Otherwise you would get you know confused at which one to use. So I'm going to keep things simple. Stack, use array DQ. In case of a uh, uh, normal queue, use a linked list. Because linked list implements a DQ, Array list also implements a DQ, right? So you have all these things at your convenience, but to make things very, very simple, because in DSA, you need stacks and queues. So for stacks, use array DQ. For linked list, use queues. We're going to see that in demo in action right now. So let's take a look at queues and stacks in action, okay? So let's say we want to create a queue, okay? So what you will do is, 
want to create a queue of integer and what is a queue by queue basically you want to have that fifo ordering that is first in first out like you know queues what it is right so let's create a queue and in order to instantiate a queue please remember in java collections we don't have a class named queue we don't have a class we have an interface named queue right and in order to implement the queue there are two choices right because we need a concrete implementation of the queue interface right and queue is an interface we can't instantiate queue right there are two options one is an array queue but that is not a good choice if you want to have fifo ordering and another one is linked list because linked list is also an implementation of the queue so always whenever if you see if you go to my graph videos you would see there are in, in bfs in bfs we use what we require a queue right and over there you would find that i have used a linked list so just this code that i'm typing typing you would find that in my graph videos right uh, where i have used bfs so always remember make things simple i mean okay this is this is a lot of theory i do understand and you might get intimidated but to make things simple for you always remember whenever we are using a proper normal queue that is like a proper fifo ordering queue we use a linked list to instantiate okay cool so we will just import 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 this we just add q dot add a couple of elements okay we won't use the add method we will use the offer method remember because that's the better way and we would offer right and just print the queue right or maybe just print uh, the you know q dot v we will get one right and then we will just pull one pull and then we will use the q dot peak okay so we just print this uh let me just comment out other things since we got out the printer and if you added just you don't get confused and you see like i think we are printing something else we are printing the address let's quickly comment out that part yeah so we are using this let's save this let's run this and you see that initially we had one and two so when we when we uh, called peak this one got printed then when we called q dot pole one was removed from the queue on the top of the queue because one was first inserted right and so one got removed and it got printed and because it was returned by the pole method and then we again we are when we are calling p we are getting two two is getting returned because now it is pointed to two it is very normal right it is like very normal to the queue okay and there is one more method that is that it just checks this is also used a lot that is q dot is empty i think this is not a method of a uh, uh, queue it is a method of collection framework so since a queue if you go up the chain uh, up the chain so a link is so basically it's a linked list right so a queue is nothing but a, so basically this queue is being implemented by a linked list right so now linked list implements a queue what does a queue do a queue extends a collection only and then collection you have this is empty method so even if on all the collections whatever you know uh, classes you have whoever implements a collection somewhere down the line in the uh, in hierarchy order you are going to get this method right so this basically says that whether your queue is empty or not and that is why if you go to my graph videos in the bfs uh, you know uh, in the, in the while i was implementing the bfs function you see that i have done this that while not queue dot is empty and then i was writing my code okay cool so this was about a normal fifo queue right again don't confuse don't confuse uh, this queue interface with the normal fifo queue that we do because this queue interface in java is slightly different from our understanding of queue our understanding of queue is basically the first in first in queue, first out of queue right now you know that if you want to implement a fifo queue you can use the queue interface right in order to implement a stack we have the stack class so now we we will implement a stack so a stack of integer stack is equals to new stack right and it has the methods like a normal stack we have push right stack dot push to while not stack empty that is while it is not empty it is the empty function um says out stack dot pop right and before that stack dot peak so pop returns the last element that was popped out if you don't want to do that that is fine just pop it we will use the peak to print it out and you will see this is basically the implementation of stack we will just import it from java.util and we are good to go let's comment this part of code and this is the way you use stacks it's first two two was inserted last so it was popped out first and you had one right so stack is if you want to implement a stack use the stack class in java 
if you want to implement a queue use the linked list use the linked list that is you want to implement a fifo queue if you want to implement a double ended queue we will use the array dq please try to understand an array dq you can use an array dq to implement a normal queue that is a fifo queue as well as you can use an array dq to implement a stack as well but we don't do that right because we have already a linked list that serves our normal fifo queue purpose and we have a like a stack class that serves a normal uh, lifo purpose right but since array dq you can insert elements anywhere right you can insert elements at the top you can insert elements at the last or bottom whatever you want to term it and then you can remove and remove elements from any position from the first or last position but you can also remove elements from the first position as well as last position so therefore you can use it in as any type you want but normally to keep things simple and to keep the convention we will use array dq uh, only when we want to use double ended queues and for that double ended queues in dsa in action the very important question that comes to my mind is 01 bfs which you can watch my video where array dq or double ended queue is what so uh, in c++ i think you have dqs so in java we have the dq interface and the corresponding concrete implementation of the dq interface is the array dq okay so that's it um, so we'll implement an array dq now so let's have a dq dq of integer dq is equal to a new array dq right and we'll just implement this we'll just add this quickly and now we'll have all those methods that we saw so we'll have offer first one we can have offer first two um that means we're adding it to the top that means basically uh right now if you print this dq right so what will happen is it will basically behave as a stack so you can understand you can use a dq as a stack as well just as i mentioned so this will print 2 1 if you see yeah you see this is because th here we are adding elements to the first only right and now if you want to remove elements if you want to remove elements let's say you want to dq dot poll first right so now two will be removed. So that is the first in first out approach is followed. So now it will be printed one, right? So if you want to, like, you can also use that dq dot peak first, right? So whenever you would be using this combination, that offer first, offer first, poll first. So whenever, if you want to use it as a stack, if you want to insert, you would ideally want to insert it the first. You would ideally want to remove it from the first as well, right? And that, and then you would be uh, using the offer first and the poll first methods. So then it will be giving as a stack. If you want to use it as a normal leafo ordering queue then you have to always offer last that means you have to always push at the end of the queue then it will behave as a queue, uh, queue normal queue and always you have to pull it from the first right and the peak also from the first right then it will be as a queue and if you want to use it as a double ended queue then you can based on the conditions you can uh, like insert it at any place you can insert it in, or in first and last you can like pull from the first you can pull from the last as i just you know mentioned in the array queue while I was discussing array dq class. So just read about it. I mean, it's it's nothing much. These are the methods, offer last, offer first, like as the name says, speak first, speak last, poll first, poll last, right? But to sum it up, to make things very simple, using stacks, use the stack class. Using normal FIFO queue, use the linked list class. Using a dq, I get an array dq, use the array dq class. An array dq is basically of type dq. Linked list also extends, a uh, like it also implements a DQ. So if you do see, uh, it implements a DQ. So instead of taking a queue, you can also write DQ over here, but normally the convention is to write Q. Uh, and the stack, it extends a vector, but let's not get into that, right? So this was all about stacks, queues, and DQs from the collection framework. Cool. Now we are left with one more part of the queue, that is the priority queue. I think this is a good time to take a break have some water, take a break of five minutes and we will then continue with the video where we would cover another important part of this video, another important aspect or another important implementation of the queue interface that is priority queue, which is slightly different from the normal queue. Okay, I hope you are back uh, after a quick break. And now let's first understand that where are we and what have we covered so far. So let's again jump to our friend, which is that particular hierarchy class. So we have covered the iterables, right? And we have covered collection interface as a whole. Uh, then we also covered the iterator uh, interface, uh, which the collection interface has, right? Uh, and then again, uh, we also have, have seen the list iterator. 
We have also seen the list interface. We have also seen the vectors array list. We have also seen linked list in action. We have seen DQs. And we have also seen the queue interface. Uh, now, from the DQ interface, we also saw that, you know, how can we use stacks queues? So, for queues, we use a linked list. And for stacks, uh, we use the stack class. Also, we can use an array DQ for the DQ operations. And apart from that, you see that there is one missing link that is the priority queue, uh, which basically implements this queue interface, right? So, this is a concrete implementation. And priority queue is also a queue. The only difference is, so in a normal queue, what happens is, uh, it, it is based on your insertion order, right? Uh, but in a priority queue, it is based on the priority that you set for that particular class, right? So let's read about a priority queue a bit. I'm very sure you must be knowing priority queue because I'm not going to like cover too much of in-depth priority queue. It's a data structure. It's not a data structure video. It's a collections video where I expect you to know these data structures between, beforehand. And I'm going to just show you that how you can implement that in Java using the collection framework, but just to give you a you know, depth. So basically priority queue, as I said, it works on priority. The implementation is based on a priority heap, which is a tree-like structure that yields an element at the end of the queue according to the priority ordering, right? Which is either defined by the natural ordering of its elements or by a comparator, new terms, new terms, and very, very important terms. And now we're going to jump right into this. But let's just give this for a while and let's move ahead. So in the case of several elements having the same priority, one of them is chosen arbitrarily, right? Elements of a priority queue are not sorted. Please remember this. They are not sorted, right? It can only guarantee that elements can be removed in a priority order and any traversal using the iterator will not guarantee that you would get the elements in sorted form. So never ever try to iterate over a priority queue. That's a very bad choice. In C++, I don't think you even get an iterator to do that. Uh, I have covered in C++. I used to be back in college, but as, as much as I can remember. But in Java, you can actually use an iterator to iterate over the priority queue. And why is it so? Because... A priority queue is implementing a queue, a queue is extending a collection, and a collection is implementing an iterable. So if you go down that chain, you would be able to iterate over a priority queue using the iterator if you want to. But is it a good choice? No, it's not a good choice to implement, uh, iterate over the priority queue because you won't be getting the elements according to the priority ordering because ideally you would be just iterating over the tree, right? The heap tree, okay? So... If you want, actually, so I will show you how you use priority queue uh, straight up and you would actually get my point, right? So let's jump into creating a priority queue first. So let's comment out this part of the code. Okay. And let's see. Okay. By the way, I will you have a small task for you. After watching this video, while well, watching this video, make notes, right? and share i mean create a document or whatever create a handwritten document whichever way you prefer and upload it somewhere in a github or a google doc or whatever is it and share the link in the comments down below and whichever whoever creates the best note i will have some gift for you i would probably give an amazon gift voucher i will announce the winners soon but i think if you do that it will not only fetch you a, a good reward from me but also it will help the others as well okay now priority queue of let's say integer you want to create of integer by the way i'm just creating integer doesn't mean that you can't create of other classes right you can create of a double you can create and all those things right okay so let's 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 implement this uh, i think it's already already imported okay now we use just have the default constructor that is the new priority queue okay and yes that's it we want to add elements, so that is pretty simple. Okay, but we can also do offer method is there as well. Because anyway, it, it, it is implementing a queue, right? So it will have those methods on the queue itself. So we'll always use the offer. pq.offer2. pq.offer0. pq.offer100. Just random elements, right? Now, we want to see which element is at the top of the queue. Or let's do like this. Let's try to, you know, traverse, uh, let's try to traverse the priority queue, not iterate, okay? Not iterate, because if you iterate over the priority queue one by one, you might not get the elements in a sort of fashion. So ideally what you want to do, we do like this. So while not PQ, let's say you want to get the top key elements, right? So let's say I have this priority queue, right? And I want to get the top two elements from here. So I have a priority queue like this and I want to get the top two elements. So what I would do is, it's very simple. So I will get a list for this. So let's talk a list of integer LST is equals new array list. 
right here i will took the let's let's name it top k top 2 right let's name it top 2 elements what i would do is i would just add top 2 dot add tq dot pole okay remove the elements and one more thing which i will do is let's say that int index is equal to 0 if index is uh, equals equals to 2 return i'm just writing a very simple code uh, i'm not taking okay take care of all the conditions okay top q top 2 dot add q dot whole and yeah what else yeah that's it okay so i'm just polling the first two elements right and um we will return and we will just print out this array list right we'll print out this array list and we will also print out the remaining part of the queue that is the tq okay cool now let's see what what we get right so let's print out this okay so we first printed okay i think we forgot to add the index plus plus that's why this we got the entire tq okay now let's see this okay so we've got zero and one right and we the priority queue so the first two elements the first two elements got popped out right and then we uh, were left with 200 right now you might say uh, that here the uh, i wanted the top two elements but i got the bottom two elements why did so now that is because okay i won't tell you now i would tell you later okay let's hang on that's all we will come to this okay so now let's say instead of the top two let's just say you want to find the bottom two and we get this bottom two Right? so now you understand at least how you like want to traverse and try to you got a feel of the methods like same methods as a queue right the whole offer that's the beauty of coding is the interfaces right and that's why interfaces are made so that you don't remember have to remember all the specific methods for every class common methods are always the same names now let's see answer your first question what if you want to get the top two elements like what should we do second is now let's go and create a class okay our own class so far we have been using the integer classes and all those things right so now we have one question okay what so now let's park this question what if we want top two elements instead of bottom two so we are parking this question as of now okay and we are going to create our own class that we would call our like maybe we will call this class student marks okay yeah student marks sounds a i know i'm very bad with examples so please bear with me so let's say we store the marks of maths and we store the maths of physics okay and we would uh, like probably have this private we would have this private we would have some you know we would have the constructors just I will generate the constructors using the source so generate uh, generate the two string methods that's important that will help us to print the class um then we will generate the <coughs> generate the getters and the setters we don't need the setters as such so we will like not have it we just have the getter methods and we will use the constructors for this so generate constructors using fields we'll have both the fields and we are good to the super call is not required we are not implementing or extending any class cool so this is it so we have this class right now let's say we want to have a priority queue right let's let's now comment uh, or let's not come to anything let's just comment these two lines and let's say we want a priority queue let's first understand the question what we're trying to do get me the top two or bottom two what should we do top two okay top two students actually it's just top k but like consider it as top two for now get me the top two or top three students whose according to their physics marks or according to their maths marks okay this is what i'm looking at right so we have a priority queue okay and we would have we have to click create a priority queue of which class we have to create of student marks class now we are using our own custom class okay please understand this pq 
and be follow me along because we are going to learn a very important concept and i don't like there are very few videos who are going to like like take you uh, like build things up from such depth right uh, because otherwise they're very you know what i've seen mostly they generally give you a very higher level of understanding and they generally don't go deep and they don't show you the inner implementation so as a result uh, sometimes we have a problem of struggling and that's why i'm like telling you all these things so that your inner concepts are very very clear and they are of national interviews right cool so now you create a new priority queue and trust me these are actually asked in interviews we will test upon tested upon these things they would actually go deep and see whether you know this concept so also if you are uh, like let's say it happened with me in a couple of interviews which who asked java like let's say one of the companies or rcs and one of the companies were goldman sachs who really really asked a lot of questions from java jp morgan is one of those companies right so all the banking companies fintech companies mostly they would ask you java then there are the service based companies so yeah i mean java is really asked in a couple of lot of companies cool uh so don't need this since java 7 we only need on the left hand side the type and now okay so let's name it what do you call it uh, i think spq that's very bad name i know but just to keep things short and concise and clean now we want to insert let's say we have a uh, okay now let's try another let's show you another method let's say we have a list of students marks okay so let's say we have a list of student marks STM, STL, no, no, what do you call it? Okay, student marks. Okay, this equals new array list, and let's say that you have, you want to add student marks, right? So new student marks, and let's say adding seventy and adding eighty, and in this way we add five more marks, or let's say yeah, five more marks. Okay, okay. So I filled this uh, student marks, right? And now I want to add these marks. So I have to add all of these marks into the priority queue. Now what we can do is we can traverse, we can traverse this uh, array list, and we can uh, add it to the priority queue one by one, right? Uh, using the for loop. But instead of that, writing so much code, we can just do it in one line. That means whenever we are using the priority queue, when we are instantiating the priority queue, you remember in array list we can take another collection. Similarly, in priority queue inside the constructor, it can take a collection. And since a list on an array list is a construct uh, is an is a is a collection itself, so I can just pass the st marks over here, and automatically uh, it will take the list and like the list, all the contents of the list will be there in the priority queue. Okay, cool. So now I want to find the top three students according to the maths marks. So what I would do is, again, I would like follow this approach, right? And maybe I would like copy this piece of code. I know it's a very bad piece of code, but yeah, I I really don't want to focus much on the coding part. Otherwise, things would get a bit uh, different. Otherwise, think I would be digressing a lot. So since it's top three, and uh, what I would do is, I would add I would make this index to zero. And top three dot add pq dot whole index plus plus. Okay, so basically what it will do is it will uh, I will print the top three. So what it is doing is basically very simple. I am like putting the student marks inside the priority queue and pulling the top three elements, the top three elements from the priority queue, and uh, I'm printing it. Now let's see what happens. What do you think? What happens? Comment it down below. Pause this video and comment down below what exactly it should happen. Let's run the code. Okay. Yes, we run into an exception. What is this exception? Java dot lang dot class cast exception. That means that it was this um, internally it was trying to cast something was happening where it was trying to cast it to a type, but it was not able to. And what was the type? This riddhi dot student marks. That means this class it cannot be cast to this interface or any object that is implementing this comparable interface. And the priority queue needs it. Why? Why? When we were doing this integer, when we were doing for a wrapper class, we were not getting any such exception. It was working. It was not working for bottom uh, top two. That's a different thing. But it, at least it was getting me some results, right? But here it is not getting any results for me, and it is getting an exception whenever we are using a custom class. What is that problem? So in order to solve this problem, we are going to learn two important and very 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 important concepts of Java collections. That is comparators and comparable interface. So let's now jump into this. So now, as a programmer, want to get the top three uh, students according to the maths marks, right? Now, how would this priority queue know that hey, I want to know, like, give me the top two students according to their or sort or whatever you're doing, like, create the heap, 
in such a way that the always the student with the highest math marks remains at the top how will you know it I, it can't get into my brain and know it right i have to somehow tell it that hey brother you please do something uh, so that at the at your top you have the student with the maximum math marks now i am not defining it i'm just adding it to the queue and expecting out from him right so this is this is not going to work right so in order to tell the priority queue in order to tell the priority queue hey priority queue i want that student marks to be at the top which has the highest maths marks there are two fields right one is the maths and one is the physics so which one do you want i want the sorting according to the maths marks so in order to tell the priority queue this there are two options the first option is using the compatible interface which is done at the class level and by class level i mean this class which uh, the uh, this class which is the type like of the priority queue of this current priority queue which you're using so what you have to do is the priority queue would expect two things either it would expect that this class will implement this compatible interface and as the name suggests if the priority queue sees that hey the student marks implements this compatible interface it means that the student marks has some comparison strategy and if it has a comparison strategy then only we can sort that object right so you see uh, like if you have if you know any sorting algorithm like bubble sort or whatever algorithm it is you see how do you sort elements you sort the elements by comparing right so basically if you're sorting an integers you compare to integers right greater than less than stuff like that but how do you compare the student marks right so you need that comparison strategy so if you don't have that comparison strategy how will the priority queue sort uh, this particular student marks for you right so whenever you are creating any custom class and you want that you know custom class to be as the type of that priority queue right you should implement the comparable interface so java has that class right and you should do it at the class level that means that hey this uh, class is compatible okay and whenever you're implementing an interface there is uh, methods that you have to implement and in this case there is this one method that is compared to so in this compared to method you can see that there is an object that is being passed so basically going to compare the current object the current instantiate of the object basically this with the uh, object that is this like the other object that is being passed as a parameter so how does this compare to works let's see that so there can be three instances right so let me write it down so let me remove this so there can be three instances always remember this so let's say you are this or the current object current object is less than the other object then it should return minus one okay this is how the compare to works right and that is why it is an int if the current object is greater than the other object then it should return one okay one more thing it doesn't necessarily has to be minus one it can be any negative number here i'm writing minus one okay it can be also minus 100 as well any negative number right similarly for this if it is greater it can be any positive number it doesn't necessarily has to be one and if the current object is equal to my other object then it has to return zero so again summing up if it is equal return zero if it is current object is greater then return any positive number or if it is less than the other object then return any negative number so with that in mind you will write the code like this so once i write the code you will understand if this since you're comparing based on the maths marks if this dot maths is less than o dot maths return any negative number let's return minus one okay cool if this maths is greater than o dot maths then return any positive number okay and if this dot maths is equals equals to that maths then return zero that's it and we are done with our writing our compared to method okay now we can replace we can replace this three lines of code by just writing one line of code which will sound really which you would find very cool that is instead of writing this three lines of if uh we can simply do this this dot maths minus o dot max this will basically translate to this line of code right okay cool now coming back coming back now we have this class implementing the comparable interface and since we are implementing this comparable interface we have implemented the compared to methods so now whenever we are saying that okay priority queue this is the student marks right object and the priority queue what it will do is it will try to see okay i have a student I have a, my type is student marks does student marks implements a comparable and if it does then it is going to call the compare to method 
it was not able to find the compared to methods and that why it was like you know uh throwing that you know class cast exception because it was trying to cast it to some comparable interface or a class that implements a comparable interface but since student marks was not a class not a not a class that was implementing the uh, comparable interface it was not able to cast it right so you see that uh, now the priority queue won't throw any error right one thing since we want to find the top two therefore we have to sort it in uh, in a different order so this should be o dot maths like we want it in, this this should sort it in ascending so we want it in descending because we want the top two first so the top element should be in the first so this should be o dot maths minus this dot maths okay the other object should come first okay okay now if we go here we would see that this would be working because now the priority queue would search for the compare to method it will call the compare to method if you also want you know i can just have a debugger over here just to see that you know, just to let you know that yeah comparator compared to compared to method is called okay just to show you okay just before running uh we need to change this to student marks okay okay and this is also student marks i think this is fine um okay and also we need to change this i think we coded it against the other priority queue so this should be spq and this should be spq as well right and now let's run the code and see okay so you can see the compare to is called multiple times so just to show you that priority queue is internally calling the compare to function of our class and as you can see you get the maths 100 and maths 97 and the maths 70 so these are the top three marks if you compare from here this 38 and 40 was not shown right so now you understood uh, like if you want to create a priority queue of a custom type what is the way to go like one way of is obviously of creating the class or uh, like or allow our class to implement the comparator interface right and in turn which will have a compare to method which will implement right anyway now the first question is the first question is obviously we are going to look at this question which we were stuck at earlier but before that let's first try to understand that hey in case of when we were using an integer right we didn't have to use or do all of these things right so how did the integer work, right? I mean, like, let's not get into the top two part, but at least we're getting the bottom two. We're not getting an exception, right? Because if you go to this integer wrapper class, it implements the comparable interface. So, so since it implements the comparable interface, the priority queue was calling the compared to methods of the integer uh, class. And as a result, it was not getting any error, right? But now it's a problem. There's one problem. We'll see what that problem is. So now the like the integer, the integer uh, class, the, com the way the compared to method is written in the integer class, it sorts in ascending order, right? And that's why we were getting the bottom two elements first, right? But in order to get the top two elements, right, we need to change the compared to function of the integer class. But are we allowed to do that? No, right? Because the integer class, we are not allowed to access that class. It's 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 a class that is defined in the Java package, right? And we can't make changes to that. And it's not a good way of as well because uh, a client, we are the clients because we are using that class. We cannot go and change the internals of this class. We can't do that, right? So what can we do over here? Uh, so let's sum up the problems and what have we solved so far. So the first problem is like whenever we want, want to like use a custom class, uh, we have to use a comparator and we have to line our own compare to function, right? And if we do that, then priority, we can, you know, use it, uh, like we can sort it, right? Uh, using the priority queue. Sort, I mean, not sort, but yeah, we can use the priority queue with that class. But let's say now, in case of an integer, if we want the integer class or whatever class we want, who, which, whose compare to method is already implemented, we can like use it, no issues, the compare to method will be called. But what if you want in a different order, right? What do we do in that case? In that case, the comparator comes into the picture. So what is that? Let's now try to fix this. Let's try to let's let's try to get the top two instead of the bottom two. Let's let me just copy this first, and let's comment this out, and let's uncomment this out, and let's type it down here. Okay, now. What do we have to do is the what the priority queue does when we are instantiating a priority queue, it takes an object of the comparator interface, right? So what is a comparator interface? Okay, let's first create a class. Okay, um, and things would be more clear to you. So let's create my custom comparator class. Okay, and let's say that it implements a comparator. 
let's say of type integer okay now we have to implement okay so as we can see that this is like giving an error so let's add the un unimplemented methods so you can see that the comparator whenever we are trying to implement a comparator interface we have to implement this method that means that this comparator interface has this method that is compare now what is the difference between the compare method of this comparator interface and what is the difference between the compare to method of this comparable interface basically both are same right since the compare to method is within this class right so therefore you already have the this object so you need one more object to compare yourself to right that is why that there is one parameter when you're using the comparator interface it has a compare method so basically now you can't you don't have that class right with you so therefore you need to pass two objects so here i would be creating a comparator of student marks uh, i think i shouldn't have done for an integer so this should be uh, student marks okay so again uh, the difference between a comparator and a comparable interface is a comparable interface should be implemented by the class itself and the comparator interface uh, should be implemented by a comparator class right and here it has a compare method as compared to the compare to method and in the compare method you should pass two objects as compared to one object in the compare to method because the, the class implementing that already has itself to compare it with right so now now here we are simply going to write so what we're going to do we are uh, probably going to Okay, so if you want to compare the student marks object, right? So then we would be doing o1.getMax minus o2.getMax. If you want to do it for the integer, right? The, which was the problem that you were solving. So, and now you want to do it for integer. I'm sorry, I should have used integer only. This would be o1 dot dot uh, o1 minus, you know, o2, right? Or o2 minus o1 because we want to compare it uh, in descending order, right? So now we have this custom comparator which implements a comparative integer. It takes two integer and it returns O2 minus O1. That is basically it is comparing in terms of descending order. Okay. So now how can we use this comparator, right? So this priority queue, while you are creating a priority queue, it takes in, a, in its constructor, it takes a comparator, right? So if we just call new my comparator class, new my custom comparator class, what happens is now instead of the ordering that this integer class is following it will now follow the ordering of this my custom comparator right so basically the whatever ordering the class is implementing that is called a natural ordering and whatever uh, ordering are passing to the priority queue as a comparator right that is called total ordering right so the total or ordering has always more precedence than natural ordering right so let's say the passing uh, a comparator to the priority queue that means you have a total ordering right so irrespective of whether the type or the class has a natural ordering or not whether it implements a comparable interface or not your total ordering or your comparator function or the compare compare function would be called always if, if you don't pass a comparator then that class or the type has to implement a comparable interface and then that compare to method is called right so first of all let's solve this problem so let's now we have passed a comparator and let's see what happens here so before running the code let's first uh, comment out this part of code as well this list part otherwise there will be some unwanted calls that would be going to this compare to method and that will confuse you confuse you so let's now run this and uh, we should be getting the top two elements right so it should be giving me 2 and 100 so let's run the code you see we get what we get the 2 and 100 right that's what we get the top two elements 102 basically and our priority queue is left with one and zero right we just implemented our custom comparator that gives us the top two elements instead of the bottom two elements now let's say we uh, the student marks let's say we have the same problem over here right so let's say now we uh, comment out this part of the code right now before moving forward we created a class that is new my custom comparator right and we passed it to this priority queue basically this priority queue needs a class an object of a class that implements the my custom comparator and in turn implements that method right that compare method now instead of creating a separate new my custom comparator what we could have done is we could have created a new anonymous inner class which is basically a concept of java so i'm not diving too much into it so instead of doing this um you we could have instead of creating a separate file for this class we could have passed this as an anonymous inner class which is a concept of java and even better we could have used lambdas that is what i'm going to use now uh, and from now on whenever we are going to pass a comparator i'm going to use this so basically what this lambdas does by the way if you're not familiar with lambdas that's fine you can read about it later but for now i will tell you how is it going to be so this since it takes a comparator so we can write it like this so the thing it like this basically now forget about the comparators 
the lambdas will do it for you. Now just think like this, you have to basically pass a compare function to the priority queue. That's all you have to do. You have to pass the compare function implementation to this priority queue. That's what you have to do. So what do you do? The, what does the compare function take? It, it, it takes two objects, right? So just take two objects. Um, you don't need to mention the type because lambdas doesn't require you to do. Re require you to define the type, right? So just write like this, a, b, and then just do b minus a. That's it, we are done. Okay, so now uh, we are getting an error because that's because lambdas are only allowed at source level 1.8 and we are at 1.7, so we will change it to 1.8 and we will see that error is gone. Now, uh, lambdas say that if you have just one line of code, basically we are just writing this. You see, this is what we are doing, right? We are doing B minus A or we are writing O2 minus O1. That's what we are doing here, right? Since it is just one line of code, uh, we don't need to write a specific return or we don't need to have the curly braces and all these things. It's a lambda specific thing, so maybe I will, I will make a separate video on Java lambdas just like this. But for now, you can think it like this, we are passing the compare function, right? And this will give us, uh, th this will do the same thing that you are doing. Now we don't even need this my custom create the separate class and all those things, right? Okay, now let's run this and we'll get the same thing. Okay, let's run this and let's see the console. Okay, let's, I think we just forgot to print it out. Uh, okay, you see 200 being printed and we are left with one zero, right? Now let's solve another problem. Actually, you would be should be able to solve this problem by now. That is now, let's say, that we comment out these two lines and we uncomment this line, right? Okay, so let's create a priority queue. So how will you pass the comparator? Let's see. So first of all, priority queue of student marks, right? S uh, P Q, right? A new priority queue. And again, uh, we are going to add, we are going to traverse this error list for int uh, marks from, or uh, maybe int uh, student marks. Um, SM from ST marks. We are just going to add it spq.add to this, you know, uh, this uh, SM, right? And here in the constructor, we can also we can pass that comparator. Just for, just what just what we saw right now. So here we will pass the comparator S1, and this will sort according to the top physics marks. So S1 dot get physics minus S1 dot get physics. And what it will do is the student marks has a natural ordering, right? But since you're passing a comparator or a total ordering function, so whatever we are passing will override the natural ordering that already exists for that class, right? Always remember a comparator always will override like a compare uh, rebel, right? Or the natural ordering. So just to make you aware of this, uh, just to show you this, what would be called, let's say that compare rebel is called, not a compare rebel, but a compare to is called, but let's say compare rebel. Uh, compared to is called right and let's copy this piece of code and let's uh, go to here now since we have to there will be two lines of code because we need to print it therefore we have to give this okay so let's paste this let's copy this again Let's first print this. We are writing this curly, under curly braces because right now there are more than two lines and lambda requires that if you have more than two lines then you have to put this under curly braces. Also you have to use a return statement. Um, yeah, so this will now go here and we have to say comparators. Compare to is called. Now we'll see which one wins, which one wins, okay? Should uh, uh, like either this compare data's compare to method is called or this uh, student marks where the natural ordering is present that means the compare two methods it's called let's see let's see so let's go to the collection test class and let's find the top three elements so you see the compare rators compare to is called that means whatever function we are passing that wins the total ordering wins and you see the student with the highest physics marks 88 then 80 and then 38 is being sorted so now to sum up things for you Normally we would use, be using comparator functions, especially and most of the time. So normally we would be using comparators interface in most of the problems in DSA. 99.9% .9 we are using going to use comparators. And the reason behind this is, you see a lot of predefined classes that exist in the lead code questions and you don't have access to this class. Do you have access? I don't think you have access to this class, right? Therefore you can't go and add the compar uh, comparable interface or maybe change the compare to method of this classes. Yeah. So therefore always you have to like pass comparators 
uh, like this to the priority queues instead of depending on the natural ordering of those functions. Uh, for a couple of wrapper classes, if you want things in the, to follow the natural ordering that is the ascending order, then you don't need to pass a comparator and you can just kind of let the integer class uh, have its own comparator method do the uh, job for you. But let's say you want to, uh, to change the logic of the comparator. Uh, but let's say you want to, do, to change the logic of the natural ordering of the integer as just as we show, shown, uh, just as we just saw. Then in that case, you have to pass the comparator. And also in classes which doesn't have any natural ordering of their own, that means they don't implement the comparable interface, then also you have to pass the comparator function. So just think like this, whenever, whenever we have to define our own ordering uh, of a class that either doesn't implement the comparable interface or implements but doesn't have implement the same compared to logic that we ideally want to, then you have to pass the comparator function and the comparator function compared to method would be called and that would be sorted accordingly, right? So this is all about priority queues. This is all about the comparable comparator. And we'll see more of comparable comparators in action in the next set as well, when we will be reading about tree sets, tree maps, right? And then these things will be a cake for, for you. But again, if you haven't understood what is comparator comparable, please rewatch this section, right? Because this is going to be a very, very important thing for you. Again, comparators is something we would be using in most of uh, the DSA questions that we'll be solving. So comparators is a total ordering, comparable is a natural ordering, natural to the particular class. Comparable is something that we're using in the inside the class itself. And it is not really very flexible because once you define it in, inside the class, you can't change the logic from outside. So change the logic from outside, you have to use the comparator. You will pass the comparator, right? And comparators are very flexible because it's just plug-in. You just pass that functions and you can, the client can pass any functions according to liking. Different, different clients can have the different comparator functions, very easy. But the comparators, it is very specific to the class, right? So that's it, comparators, comparables, priority queues. With this, we come to an end to the queues. And maybe if you want to take a short break, take a break, have some water, right? And next, we will be looking into sets. Okay, so let's now again jump to this picture, once again to this hierarchy. And uh, we are done with queue interface, we are done with dequeues. Uh, we have seen priority queues in action, we learned about comparators and comparables, we learned about iterables as well. So we are done with you know this side of the hierarchy, we are left with set now, which is going to be the last part of the collection which we are going to cover. So set basically is an interface, right? And hash set is an implementation of set and linked hash set is something that extends and has set. We're going to see all of that in action. And then we have a sorted set that again extends it in set. Then there's a navigable set that extends a sorted set. And then a tree set, which ultimately ends up implementing a navigable set, right? So let's see what all of these are. So the sets uh, contains the following methods. Uh, the contains all, add all, remove all, uh, clear. That means basically empty the set. These are some of the functionalities that the sets interface brings in. Now, as we see that has set basically implements a set. So let's first quickly look at what a has set is and how we can implement that. Okay, cool. So let's now comment all of this code. Uh, we don't require this code anymore. So let's quickly comment out this part. Okay, so now let's create a set. Okay, so one of the implementations of the set is the has set. So let's create a set of integer set is equals new has set. Now what is a set? So basically set is a collection of unique elements. So even if you try adding a duplicate element to a set, it will remove the duplicate elements. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's try to add. So we will use the add methods because that is a part of uh, a collection. So we will, uh, set is also a collection. So basically it will be able, we will be able to add. So now let's try to add a set. Now we have added these elements and now let's print the set. So we will see that uh, these things are there in the set. So we will see two, three, four. Okay. Now let's say we want to add set dot add for two again. And if you try to print it, you would see that you will have only one instance of two because a set doesn't supply, allow duplicate elements. It only allows unique elements. Okay. So now uh, we can also create a set from an add list. So because a set takes a collection as well, so we can add this ALST that we just created, I think what was the name of the list? We added an A list, right? So A L I S T, you can just add in and if you print this, you will see one, two, three, four, right? Because it is only storing the unique elements, okay? You can also remove from the set by this element. So if you just do set dot remove two, you will see two is being removed and we can <coughs> just see one, three, four, okay? There are a couple of more methods in the set. Like if you want to do a set dot clear, you just do this and the set would be emptied. So we would be seeing an empty set just like this. Also, if you want to do the set intersection, there is something called a retain all method. So basically it give, give you this intersection of two sets. So let's, for example, let's say we have a set one and let's say we have an intersection. We have a set of integer, let's say set two, new has set, right? And let's say we, let's see, change this. Okay, so now 
if we do set one, so let's first print the <coughs> set one and set two. Okay, let's print a set one um, and let's print a set two. So now if we print the set one, okay, and now let's try out this method set one dot retain call set two and then we print a set set one and then we print a set two and we will just write another function here after retaining uh, sorry we will just print out uh, this so that you are able to understand so let's see what we are doing we are adding we are creating two sets and we want to like first print a set one and set two and then we call the retain all method on the set one passing the set two and let's see what happens first and then we will see okay so let's just move this line and let's save this and let's run okay so initially we had the set uh, that is the first set is one two three and the second set is two three four and now after retain calling the retaining all retain all function right uh, so you see in second set is unmoved the set which we passed that is unchanged but the set which uh, on which this retain all method was called you see the one is deleted because it is giving you the intersection of two sets right so please remember the set which you are passing as a parameter to the retain all that would remain unchanged but the one on which you are calling that function retain all uh, that set would be changed right and you would be getting the intersection of the two sets right so that is the retain all method then you have the remove all method as well so that basically gives you the set difference right and again the set 2 will remain unchanged but all the changes would be done in the set 1 so if you run this method you see that it is a difference that means 2 3 the intersection was removed and you only have one right so that is what you call a set difference these are basic operations related to set now if you want to do an union you will do an add all right and if you just print the set again you see that one two three four is being added basically the set two unions are being done right so this is very basics of set now what is basically a hash set so in a hash set since the concept of hashing is involved now i'm not going too much deep into how hashing is done and all but that is a separate video altogether and i would be implementing a hash map and a hash set from scratch in one of my later videos on the series but for now what i would say is so in a hash set right the insertion and the deletion takes constant time roughly constant time or average complexity is con constant and the order there is no ordering over here and the elements are not sorted as well so let's say if you want to traverse this set or you want to iterate over this set so let's say now if we just have this we just remove the uh, we have the set one right and let's remove let's comment out these lines and let's say you want to traverse or iterate over the set two so we can do that because the set two is basically a set is basically a collection and collection implements the iterable so you can iterate like this so if you do x you see there would be no ordering right at all like it doesn't follow the insertion order it doesn't follow anything at all right so if we just let me add one more item set 2 dot add 0 so you see that no ordering is followed at all you see 0 2 3 4 right i mean neither it is following any order like it uh, uh, you might feel that hey this is maintaining a sorted order but actually it is not it is pretty random like so so whenever using a hash set there is no ordering at all and you cannot sort as well sort the elements as well right so only use hash set when you don't need any ordering so whenever you want a first insertion or a first removal uh, of elements then a hash set is very very useful now what if you want to you know maintain the insertion order right of an hash set what do you do so that's where the linked hash set comes into picture so if you see in this pic again so there is this linked hash set that extends the hash set right so basically it is a hash set but it also maintains a linked list uh, behind the scenes that kind of remembers the order in which the uh, elements were inserted so if we just copy this piece of code and instead of a set now if we use a linked hash set right and we just you know let's use a set 3 just import it so linked hash set is an extension of the hash set right it extends the hash set it all same it has the same functionalities on top of it it just maintains the order with the help of a linked list right so now if we traverse through let me now traverse to the set 2 and set 3 as well so you will see here the insertion order is maintained but over there the insertion order is not right so let me change it to set 3 and you would see the difference okay uh, let me change it to set 3 as well let me also change the print statements okay now let me run the code we are set so you see here uh, the insertion order is not maintained it is being printed randomly and here if you see uh, the like the insertion order is actually maintained in the next set the linked hash set so you see 2 3 4 and 0 right so this is the basic difference between a hash set and linked set uh, linked hash set 
Linked asset has slight performance issues over asset though like again the complexity is like, uh, like, like almost the same but still since ha it has to maintain the linked uh, list in between apart from the hashing that it has to do. So normally we use a asset but in very specific cases like probably when we are implementing an LRU cache there we actually use something called a linked hash map which are going to come uh, very soon uh, on this video itself but uh, it is very similar to this you know linked hash set. So yeah, I mean, normally we use hash set, okay? We don't re really require linked hash set unless we have a very specific use case where we also want to, you know, also maintain or also remember the order in which the elements were inserted, right? Again, I think this takes two parameters. Uh, the one parameter is basically when, uh, like now there are two options. Either we want to like uh, maintain the order in which the elements were inserted or we want to maintain the order in which the elements were last accessed, right? So in that we can just pass a parameter to this linked hash set, right? So not going too much deep into that because we really don't require in that depth in the ESS. So you just can read about it. Okay. But yeah, so this was about sets. Now one last important thing that I want to show is here we use the set of integer. Now what if we want to use a set of student marks? Uh, so let's change this to has set. Let's comment this piece of code, right? And let's make this to student marks class. And let's, you know, uh, instead of adding like this, let's use the, uh, like this list that we have and pass it to the set because a set can also accept a uh, collection as in its constructor and list is a collection so yeah it will accept that so what is what was the name of the student list let me get that st marks right so let's pass that add a list of student marks to the constructor of the set right and then try to print the set okay uh, this will be student marks and Let's make it X. Okay, cool. So now if you want to like instead of have using an integer or the primitive or the, or the wrapper class or the primitive data type int, if you're using your own custom class. Okay, so let's see what happens. Nothing much. We like pretty much get the set, right? Uh, so here we can see that uh, we have like five instances, five records of the set. Let's say you want to see that whether this particular element is there in the in the set or not, right? So <clears throat> ideally, when we have, when we had this set one class, right, and it took a list. So let's say that in the set one, uh, we wanted to check that whether this contains the element one, right? And let's say he. Let, we also wanted to check that whether this set contains set one contains the element 100 or 200 which is not there so it contains the element one but it doesn't contain the element 200 right so in that case it should give me true and false because the contains method checks whether an if an element is present inside the set it returns true otherwise it returns false okay so here we get true and here we get false okay so now let's do the same thing for this uh, this class that is set two uh, sorry set three which basically is a uh, is a type our own custom class that is the student marks now let's say if we want to get set three dot contains and let's say we create a new student marks of let's say we we just uh, copy this the first one okay that is of 70 and 80 okay <clears throat> let's say and we pass this here okay let's comment these two lines out and now let's say that we don't want to print the set as well uh, otherwise it will create a confusion so yeah so now we want to check the inclusivity of this particular entry inside the set right of student marks type now ideally this should be there and this should return true right uh, and also uh, we print this out so yes uh, cool so now let's we'll try to print this out and ideally this should give me true because this en entry is there obviously this entry is there inside the set right uh, because we just saw that it's there so let's see oops it gives us false but if we print the set let's print the set this entry is definitely there then why it is giving false let's print this out so we just saw that this entry is there so let's print it again you see this is giving false but you see the same entry 7080 is there you can see mass 80, 70 and physics 80 this entry is there but here when we are trying to check the inclusivity it is okay, saying no it's not there it's false okay so understand that why this is happening we have to first understand a little bit about how, how a hash set works behind the scenes right like whenever whenever you insert an element into the into a hash set right a hash set not all the set into a hash set 
a hash code of that element is being generated right and then it is mapped to a particular bucket right and then from that bucket it checks all the elements right so let's say each bucket is a linked list let's say okay though from java after java 1.5 i think it is like a balanced binary search tree but for the simplicity we will consider a linked list right uh, so now whenever we are uh, like putting an element inside an hash set the hash value of that element is generated right and after that hash value is generated it goes to that particular bucket where that element might lie and that bucket is a start of a linked list so it will check the linked list one by one and then it will try to compare hey is the is, is, is the value of the current object that we are trying to check the inclusivity of that is passed in the contents method is it is it equal to any of the methods in that particular list that is then inside the bucket right if it's not the case then we return false so you can see there are two methods involved over here one is to generate the hash to generate the hash of that particular uh, like uh, like object or the particular element the hash code is being called the hash code method of that class is called and when you get that hash code method of the class that you get from the object class so if this method let's say the student marks method is not implementing the hash code class we would be taking the hash code method of the object class that is the parent class of the student marks every object class has its own hash code method which is basically nothing but the memory address right so first based on the hash code of that particular object you have to figure out that what is the bucket number where your element might lie right and once you figure out the bucket number you go to the uh, all the elements that lies in the bucket where i traversing the linked list or the binary search tree whatever is it and you just basically compare the two elements right now this comparison is done by the equals method again this is a class of the uh, this is the method of the object class which you can override and implement your own equals method for your object class right now the thing is there are two um, two things involved over here as you can understand Again, these things are going to be very clear once we like implement this class on our own. So, if you if you don't follow everything, that's completely fine. Uh, at the end, you would have get a hang of the things, right? If let's say for the student marks, right? We have not overridden the. So you can see if I just go over here, I have not overridden the hash code or the equals method of this class, right? So what is what is the parent of this class? The parent of this class is the object class because every class in Java is uh, has its parent as an object class if it is not extending any class. So in the object class, the hash code is implemented such a way that if you are asking that hey what is the hash code of my current student marks it will give you the memory address right and if you are asking for the equals method it is going to like the compare the reference values of the two objects that's it that's it right so therefore what you can understand is that whenever we are creating a new object right the hash code of the memory address is changing right because when we inserted the entry of this particular student that has iron mark 7 10 80 in that particular set it had a different hash code it had a different memory address hash code is equal to memory address since we haven't implemented our own hash code function right and then we again created a new student marks again we created a new object in the memory so different memory address and as a result as a result the set is treating this as two different objects that's it that's why it is saying hey this object doesn't exist the object that we're passing has a different hash code that is why it is going to the wrong bucket and that is why it is not able to find out the, the this particular object do it exist inside the set right because how will the set come to understand that hey this object that you are passing new student 70 80 and the object that lies inside the set that is this 70 80 this object right are same for that we have to override the equals and the hash code method in this custom class right now you, know, you will again ask that hey for integer we, we didn't have to write and do all these things no because integer already has this own equals and hash code method implemented right and hash code you have to implement because otherwise how would you find the right bucket maybe let's say let's say you implement the equals method okay you just implement the equals method right so in that case what happens is this will still give you an error because if you if you don't implement the hash code method you won't be able to find out the right bucket you would you might end up going to a wrong bucket and then like don't even hit the right bucket right and that bucket <coughs> won't have your elements so obviously it is going to say no uh, like it is uh, my set doesn't contain this particular element and if you don't uh, like override the equals method let's say you just write the <coughs> you override the hash code method in that case you would go to the correct bucket but then once we, so you go to the bucket that is a starting of a linked list now you traverse the linked list one by one but and they are like now it will be checking the equals method like hey uh, this this of current uh, linked list uh, node right is this node of the linked list value is it equal to the element that we are trying to compare with and if they are not equal then it is like going to return false and if you haven't implemented the equals method it is just going to check the reference which is obviously not going to be the same and it will return false and won't be able to find it so like to in a nutshell like i understand if it is too heavy for you just try to remember it like this whenever we are using a has set and we are using our own custom class right we have to override 
the equals and hash code method of the class, which is exactly what we're going to do right now. And that is going to solve our problem. Otherwise, this contains method will fail, right? So let's go to the student marks and we are going to generate a hash code and uh, equals to method. Again, these, these two are very, very important questions that you would get asked in every interviews. And not only for interviews, this, this why should you override the equals and hash code method? Apart from that, uh, you would like, may, there will come a lot of cases in your DSA questions where you have to implement, you have to create like, insert your own class inside and has set your own has custom class inside the has set and there you have to actually implement the equals and hash code method otherwise you're going to run into trouble so <clears throat> and then you would be having a very very hard time in debugging the code trust me uh, so that is why these things are very important so let's generate the hash code and the equals method from here so you see just just generated a hash code this is like uh, like like this is what the id generated for me so i'm not going to bother too much into it and then there is this equals method. So equals method is first comparing whether these two marks are equal. First, they're checking that whether this is the same reference object. Then it is obviously true. If it is null, then you're returning false. Then just checking that whether it is the two, two objects at the instance of the same class because it takes an object class, right? Because it is overriding the equals method of the object class. That is why it takes the object as a parameter. So then we are doing the typecasting, right? Into student marks. And then we are checking that whether the maths and physics marks are equal. If both the maths and physics marks are equal, then I can treat it as the same object, right? So we save this. Uh, and then we go here and now if you try to see that whether this this contains this particular object or not now though the reference value would be different because we're creating a new object here still this set tree will say no this object is being contained in a set because now the hash code is no longer generated by the memory address and the equality is doesn't work on the reference values of the memory address now we have our own equals and hash code method in place and therefore it would the set will say that hey yes it will go to the right bucket for this object, then it would traverse the list in that bucket and it would, uh, one of the values inside that linked list on one of the nodes inside the linked list will say, hey, this equals to the current object that you're passing and therefore it will return true. So now you see it returns true, right? So to sum up things, you should always e uh, implement the equals and hash code whenever using a hash set, right? Okay, so this was all about sets. Now we are done with hash set and linked hash set and in this picture we will see the sorted set, the navigable set and the tree set which is again a very very important part, right? So the sorted set as we saw extends the set interface to provide the functionality for handling sorted sets. So here uh, there would be an like the, here the sets would be sorted. So if you are trying to like pull out elements you would get uh, in a sorted fashion, right? So the sets basically would be sorted and that, this is done by using a balanced binary search tree. So if you since the elements are sorted if you're traversing the set using an iterator or a for loop, you would find that the sets are ordered, right? And, and the sets are ordered according, either according to the natural ordering or according to the total ordering. That means if you have passed any comparator to the set. So we can pass comparator to the sorted set as well. We will see that in action when we are coding, just similar to the parity queues. So what are the elements we have? We have this first and the last method. The first method uh, returns uh, the first element currently in the sorted set and the last method returns the last element currently in the sorted set, okay? The elements are chosen based on the ordering used by the sorted set, okay? Then we have a navigable set interface which again extends a sorted set interface, right? With navigation methods to find the closest match for specific search targets. So basically, uh, we can search for elements, right? In, the, in, in this navigable set and it adds extra functionality on ter in terms of a sorted set, right? And here you have a couple of methods in the navigable set interface that is poll first, poll last. You also have ceiling, floor, higher and lower. These these are very important methods uh, that, you know, power up your sorted set. So as the name suggests, the poll first method removes and returns the first element and the poll last method removes and returns the last element, right? That means uh, last as in according to the sorted order. Uh, ceiling method returns the least element in the navigable set or in the set that is greater than or equal to E, right? And the flow returns the greatest element in the set that is less than or equal to E. Higher returns the least element in the set that is greater, that is strictly greater than E and the lower is like strictly less than the argument E that you are passing. Now these are very, very important methods and <clears throat> these are very, very often used in uh, range interval problems. So if you haven't checked out my range interval series, range interval pattern problems, it's a very, very important problem, especially for Google interviews. Google asks a lot of problems from there. So please go and check out that video on pattern interval. And in most of the videos, you would find these navigable set, these ceiling flow, higher, lower in action. If you also go to my calendar series problems, right? I have four problems in that series. If you go to that video, you would find it. In that tree map video, I have used floor, higher, lower. So I would highly recommend you to go through these videos so that you can actually, you can actually understand how these ceiling, floor, and these, these methods are used, right? Uh, 
so yeah, I mean, you can definitely go and check out those videos. That will really help you a lot. Also, you can solve a couple of questions, right? And like range model is one of those questions that is a lead code hard question, very frequently asked in Google. And uh, there uh, you will find most of these T sets, T maps, these 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 methods in action. And then if you if you just after understanding this, reading this, you will solve these problems. You would understand it how this is being. So I would suggest after watching this video, go and watch the point calendar series four problems. I would attach the link to it in the description, and then you would be able to like see this more in action, right? But I, anyway, I want to like uh, walk you through, through a couple of methods. Okay, now let's jump into the tree set. Uh, so we were done with has set. Now let's go for the tree set. So as we say, we want to code against the interface. So we want to use a navigable set or maybe we can use a set that, that also works. So let's use a set only. So let's say a set of student marks. Let's only use this um, tree set equals to new tree set right set let's import tree set okay so uh, you can see in this tree set i have added this couple of entries of student marks now if i want to like uh, traverse through this tree set one by one so let me just copy this and uh, let me try to traverse this tree set you will find that i will be getting elements uh, or i will be getting the student marks objects in a sorted order Right now, the thing is, ki, uh, I have not passed any comparator to this tree set, so that would ideally mean that the compare to interface, that the compare to method will be called because the student marks implements the comparable, and the compare to method will be called. And based on our match marks, this will be getting sorted. So let's see. So you see, the compare to method is called comparables. Compare to method is called, and based on the match marks, it has been sorted. Right. Now let's say we don't want this and we want to sort it on the physics mass. So we would pass our comparator just as we saw. So S1 comma S2, we will just pass a comparator. The tree set like a paradigm accepts a comparator and we will just say S2 dot get physics minus S1 dot get physics. And now you will see this is being sorted based on the top physics mass in descending order. So you see this is sorted on the descending order. And similarly, like a priority queue, if you are not passing any comparator, then it would expect that the type of object that you're passing should have implement a comparable interface. And if it is not implementing a comparable interface, then it would give you a class cast exception as we got in the priority queue. Very similar to that, right? So this is tree set. Now let's take a look at the couple of more functions like ceiling, floor and all. So let's create another set, uh, set of integer, uh, set four is the set five. Let's call it set five. I know I'm giving very bad names today, but it's fine. Um, and since this is an integer, so I'm just uh, thinking that natural ordering is going to be followed because integer implements the comparable and that is why I'm not passing the comparator and set 5 dot add 8 set 5 dot add 3 okay, so just, I just wrote a code where I added this uh, four elements to the set five and uh, which is basically a tree set and it is going to be sorted in ascending order. So it is going to print zero one eight three. Uh, let's see eight. So let's print this and let's see what it is printing. Let me just recommend this part of code. Now let's run this code and see. So if we get zero one three eight, that is it is being sorted in the natural ordering of this integer class, right? That is the compared, compared to method has been called. Okay, cool. Now let's say, so we have the set. So now let's say we want to find the element uh, that is, you know, uh, we want to find the floor of a particular number, right? So let's say you want to find the floor of one. So floor means that we would get a number, we would find the closest element that is just, you know, less than or equals to that particular number. So in that case, it, in this case, it should return one, right? Here we have a problem because the floor method is a part of the navigable set, not a normal set. So that's why it would be a good way of defining this as a navigable set and that way we would not be having this uh, compilation error because this flow method is a part of the navigable interface, not the set interface, right? Let's just uh, do a print in here. Otherwise it would be tough okay, to differentiate. Now, if you print this, you will see we get one, right? Now, if you want to say, okay, give me the element uh, which is just less than or equal to two, that means that is one again. Right now, if you do higher, in that case, is strictly higher as a, stri a strictly uh, greater than one. The element which is strictly greater than one, then in that case, 
we get 3. The element which is strictly just strictly greater than 1 is 3. Similarly, if we do lower for 1, we get 0 because the element which is the greatest but strictly lower than 1, it is 0. And if we do ceiling of 1, we would get 1 because 1 exists, right? But if we do for 2, we will get 3, right? The element which is greater than equals to 2 in this and the least element that is greater than equals to 2 in this current set. So that's it about tree set. So once again recapping in this picture, we did see the set interface. We saw hash set, right? Uh, where we saw that if we have to implement the equals and the hash code methods, then if you have to maintain the order in a hash set, then we use the linked hash set. Then we saw a solid set, navigable set, where navigable set gave us extra functionalities over a solid set and a normal set, like giving this ceiling floor key functions and then uh, implementation of the navigable set or a solid set was this tree set. Uh, where the elements were sorted and as a result the insertion time and the removal time of these sets were uh, you know log in time log logarithmic complexity because the balance binary search trees in were into action but for a hash set the insertion time were you know oh, constant so whenever the order doesn't matter and we don't want to sort the elements then hash set is definitely preferred because of better performance but in case of where we need ordering when we need sorting uh, then we have to use a tree set so that's all about sets and with that we come to an end to the collection interface, but we are still left with one very, very important topic that is maps. So now let's jump into maps. So basically in Java collection framework, map is very analogous to set, right? The only difference is a set is a collection, but map is not, right? So set extends a collection, but the map interface doesn't extend the collection as we saw in that hierarchy structure in the very first part of this video. So let's now quickly jump into the picture first. So as you can see over here is that, you know, you have an iterable, right? And the collection interface extends the iterable. That means the collection can be iterated. Every collection can be iterated. Then we have the list, queue, and set, which we also, but if you see the map, a map interface has no relation with collections at all, which ideally means it's a separate interface altogether. And the reason behind this is very simple. So map is nothing but a mapping of a particular key with particular value. That's it, right? So that is why it doesn't, you know, extend the collection interface. If you want to you know, like zoom in into this map interface, you see that a map interface has basically again like very similar to a hash set. Uh, there is a hash map that implements this map interface, and then there is this linked hash map that extends this hash map. If you want to have an ordering of the elements, we are all going to see this later in the video. And then we have a sorted map interface, very similar to a sorted set that you know uh, extends the interface of a map. Uh, then we have a navigable map, very similar to the navigable set, and then we have a tree map, and we also have a, uh, in, have a new class over here that is the hash table that implements the map interface we are going to see all of this in action very soon uh, so now you can see over here for sets right if you go up we, for set we have a set of e right one element right and here we, we have a map of kv now this kv is nothing but a generic type for key and value this map takes two parameters two inputs and that is why here uh, like it's basically two generic types are mentioned over here uh, as compared to uh, like list or a set which takes in one input parameter right because a map is defined by an entry and an entry consists of keys and values right so as you can see in this picture this map interface has no connection with collection at all and neither it extends the iterable interface right so as a result a map cannot be iterable but what if we want to traverse a map or we want to iterate through a map we might need it right we might to need to traverse to the entries of the map right then what do we exactly do so basically for that we have this map dot entry uh, interface that the, this map consists of and we have certain methods exposed right that converts this into a set and we know that a set is a collection, right? So once we can convert this map into a set, right? A set of map dot entry, right? Then we can traverse that set because we know that set is a collection which is basically an iterable. So we will see all of this in action. Don't worry and don't get too intimidated yet. Okay, so let's uh, first look at a little bit of about maps. So as I said, a map defines mappings from keys to values, right? Uh, the key value pair is called an entry, right? A map does not allow duplicate keys. Very similar to set, but it, it won't allow duplicate keys. So now let's see why the duplicate keys are not allowed, right? Because let's say that you, you say that, okay, with Riddhi, Riddhi's roll number is 34, right? And then you want to, you know, again, put an entry where you say Riddhi's roll number is 36. So now, now if you want to ask the map that, hey, give me the roll number of Riddhi, and Riddhi is the key and the value is 34 and 36, the map would be confused, right? Because it can only maintain one value of Riddhi, right? Uh, so that is why uh, the map does not allow duplicate keys and hence all the keys are unique. 
uh, and both the keys and values must be objects right that means uh, you cannot have primitive data types if you have you want to have primitive data types then you have to use the wrapper class right it's it's very uh, generic right uh, a map is not a collection and the map interface does not extend the collection interface right now the, ma the mappings can be viewed as a collection in a various ways which we are going to see in code very soon so it can be seen in three ways one as a key set so basically you can convert all the keys you can tell the map hey give me all the keys that you have in the map right and give me it, it, it in a form of a set right the second thing you can do is you can give, you can ask the map to give all the values that exist in the map as a collection as a list right and then you can ask the map to give a set of entries an entry basically is, is any object that implements that map.entry interface so we will see that in action as well so these are the three ways that we can implement a map right so now let's look at the map interface methods so there is this one put method right that basically puts an object right inside a map so it inserts the key value entry into the map right it returns the old value previously associated with the specified key if any otherwise it returns the null value okay then we have the get method which basically gets for a particular key it gets you the the, the required value for that associated with that particular key and if there is no value associated then it returns null right uh, then we have the remove method as the name suggests it, it you know basically you know removes that particular entry from that map or particular key from that map then we have the contains key very similar to uh, a set like the set we had contains and here we have contains key and contains value and then there is the size that indicates the size of the map and then is empty function right which basically indicates that the map is empty or not very analogous to the set interface methods now one thing to note over here is a set is a collection of elements right and map is all about entries right and entries again consist of keys and values right so we are going to see all of these methods in action very soon when we will be having a complete implementation of a map right so these are the methods of the map interface and whichever in, uh, concrete classes would be implementing the map interface they would be having these methods and that i will show in code very soon Cool. Now we have some bulk operations like put all methods. So put all methods is basically you can, you know, this is very similar to the add all methods of a collection, right? So in case of a collection, we have add, right? And add all. Instead of, in case of a map, we have put and put all. So basically it's not adding, it's putting, right? So whenever it's a map, try to remember this put method, right? And then we have three more methods. As I said, you know, if you want to traverse the map, iterate over the map, we have to convert this map into a collection. And for that, we have a key set that returns, gives us a set, which is a collection in turn. Then we have a set of values, which gives us back a collection it can be a list it can be a set uh, and then it uh, basically is an entry set uh, which basically gives a set of map dot entry right so we'll see all of this in action as well now one thing to note over here is the values in a map can be duplicate right but the keys in a map has to be uh, unique and that is why if you see so whenever you're returning a key right it, it is basically returning you a set right so if you want a collection of keys it gives you a key set right because keys are unique right but the values, it is a collection, but for when you're calling the values method, it is returning a collection because values can be duplicated. Now let's look at this interface that is entry. Uh, so basically each key value in the entry set uh, is basically represented by an object implementing the nested map.entry interface, right? So if you if you go inside the map, right? If you go inside the map class or the map interface, uh, you would see that this there is a there is this interface, there is another interface called map.entry, right? And uh, any any object right any object or any class which is implementing that map dot entry interface right it is basically it contains this pair that is this key value pair right and an entry in the entry set view can be manipulated by the methods that exist in this interface which you can see over here so there are three methods get key get value and set value right so now let's look at the implementations of a map so now a map is a very analogous to set in terms of the classes and the implementations right so you can see the classes hash map and the hash table implements the unordered maps the class linked hash map implements ordered maps so basically uh, let me break it down for you right so we have this map interface and the hash map implements the map interface right and and hash map works very similar to a hash set right so you know the time complexity of a hash map right if you want to insert and you want to remove an element it is like average constant time right but the ordering of the elements in a hash map similar to hash set is not there so if you want the ordering right if you want the ordering according to its insertion order similar to a linked hash set here you have a linked hash map that extends the map class and then you have a sorted map very similar to a sorted set where the tree map is an implementation of the sorted maps now, now let's look at the hash table class so basically the hash map class is not thread safe and permits only one null key however the hash table class is very similar to an hash map the only difference is it is thread safe and permits non-null keys and values only right so in hash map you can have 
uh, one null key, right? You, like you can map a use a key which is a null value, right? It's pretty weird. We don't use it, but yeah, it's possible. Now the thread safety provided by the hash table class, you know, comes with the performance penalty. So basically, hash maps are always the better to use. We don't normally use hash table unless it's required. And in an interview, uh, people will ask you these questions that what is the difference between a hash map and a hash table, right? So hash map implementations basically are based on a hashing algorithm that I just mentioned. The operations on the map rely on the hash code and equals method. The key objects very similar to an hash set. So please remember whenever we are implementing a hash map uh, for any particular type, we must ensure that type has this equals and hash code method implemented because hash map behind the scenes works very similar to a hash set. We have this bucketing concepts and all those things that is working. And for that, the equals and the hash code method is very, very important. I've already covered it uh, during my set uh, part uh, when I was covering the sets. Right? and it is very similar to that right so here the hash code and the equals method will be based on the keys in set we have the elements that we were writing the hash code and you know uh, uh, the equals method on and here we will be, be comparing based on the keys that's the only difference right okay so this linkedin hash map maintains its element order in the way they were inserted however there is another way we can also maintain its elements uh, in their access order right from least recently accessed to most recently accessed and the ordering mode can be specified in one of the constructors of the linked hash map class which is basically also you can go and search up uh, the LRU cache question in lead code and you can see and you can basically solve that question using linked hash map it's a linked hash map find its usage in, in LRU cache basically uh, so you can go and code out that question so then uh, you can understand right or maybe I can cover a video uh, on that Okay, so both the hash map and the link hash map classes provide compatible performance, but the hash map class is the natural choice. Obviously, the ordering is not issue, not an issue because again, like similar to a linked hash set, your hand linked hash map also maintains a linked list uh, to maintain the order. So therefore, uh, it is suggested that if you don't have the ordering issue, please go and use hash map because it's slightly better in terms of performance than a linked hash map. Operations such as adding, removing, finding an entry based on key are in constant time as these hash the key as I said, and finding an entry, like operations such as finding an entry with a particular value are in linear time because you have to, you have to go searching through the entries, right? So yeah, if you are searching via key, that takes constant time, right? But if you are searching through a particular value, you know, that we dumbly don't really need, then you have to go through all the entries, right? And as I said, in a linked hash map, adding, removing and doing the other operations can be a slightly slow, slower because there is a linked list that has maintained the traversal of map is true one of its collection views, which I, which I already talked about and we will see it in code. Uh, and the traversal time for a linked hash map is proportional to the current size of the map, right? Like regardless of the entries that the map has, but for an underlying hash map, it is based on the, it is proportional to the capacity of the map. So now can you tell me that why is it so? Let me know down in comments down below and I will pin the right comment, okay? Now, okay, so I think this is a good time to start, you know, with some coding uh, demo for at least the hash map and the linked hash map and let's jump onto the code. So let me just comment out the previous code that we had. Okay, so let's ex let's create a map right so we have a map and let's we always code against the interface so we won't uh, in the left hand side we'll have a map class instead of a hash map right and let's create a hash map right and very similar to hash set we can create a hash map using this uh, constructor uh, let me import this now please note whenever there is the concept of hashing and hash set you have to implement you have to make sure that you have implement you are implementing the hash set and the equals method uh, you are implementing the hash code and the equals method. Okay, so this will give an error because let's say we want to create string to integer uh, and let's say we want to say, okay, uh, Riddhi's ID is one. Let's say we take some more values map dot put Raj um, to, you know, two. And let's put some more values like Chandler and let's put seven. Okay, so now if you want to get one of these values so we'll write map dot get riddhi we will search according to the key and we will get one okay so let's run the code and we'll see this is one right now let's say that uh, we type a value that doesn't exist right then it will uh, it will return me a null so it returns me a null now since it returns a null right what the problem that might occur is that you know you can sometimes run into an exception right okay so let's say that you know uh, this map this string there's this key value pair is basically of string and this is some of some like student marks let's say okay and we want to do something like this so let's say we put uh, so whenever uh, we search for this particular key we get the student marks and then we want to do something like this like dot get maths 
right so let's say this entry this entry if it is not there it returns null and then since it is null so null dot get maths will give me a null pointer exception error right because we can't call any method on null uh, object right so in order to do this in order to like get rid of this there is another method there is this another method that we can uh, see that is the map dot get uh, that is get or default which is which really helps us a lot uh, especially while we are solving dsa problems and in a lot of other places so let's say if this entry doesn't exist right uh, let me now change it to integer once again right so let's say if this doesn't exist then it will return me let's say a zero right something like that okay but if this exists let's say if this entry exists like this this in this case the entry for raj will exist then we will return two so we'll just print out the values and see for first it should return zero because djsk doesn't uh is, is not there in the map but raj is there right so we would get zero and two right so basically we are like keeping null out of the window right and therefore we are ensuring by using this getter default method we don't run into any sort of exception by always making it return a default value also there is this contain key method uh, which we can see so this contains key riddhi uh, which is going to return true uh, so you can just see this so basically it just checks whether this key is present or not also, we can remove a particular entry in a map by its key. So, let's say we want to remove Raj. Okay, so now we have removed Raj. So, let, let's now check whether this Raj uh, is contained in the map or not. It should return me false and it does, right? So, I have removed Raj from the map. Okay, so now let's also look at a very important concept that is very important while we are traversing graphs, right? Let's say we want to create an adjacency list. So, a good way of doing so is, uh, so basically what is an adjacency list in a graph? It basically is a, a node, a collection, a, a mapping of a node to the list of nodes it can be traversed from that particular node. So, I it is like this so the, this is this node let's say this this, this is uh, like uh, identified by integer so this node is adjacent to a couple of other nodes right so that is why this mapping is from an integer right so this is a node number and this is a list right a list of node numbers which are adjacent to this particular node right so let's call this adj dot new hash map right uh, let me just give a briefly work to it so that your concepts gets clear at least on this map part. So let's say this one has an edge with two, right? And this one no, a node has an edge with three, right? And let's say there is this another node, which is three, which has an edge with five. Let's say these are the three nodes. So let's say, and this is coming uh, with the help of an uh, like an array list, right? So this is maintained in some sort of array list or list of pairs or something like that, right? Okay, so now let's say that we want to put this entry right so what we would do we would do put right so we would write a code like this so we will first check if adj dot get if adj dot get one right uh, is equals to equals to null okay then what we have to do we have to create a new array list for one right otherwise we because see right now if you if you print this array list there is no entry for one right and since there is no entry for one this there is no list right so how can you insert or uh, like how can you insert uh, into an array list which doesn't exist so we have to create an array list first so that's why we have to first you know create this array list right and once we have created this array list then we can you know put a uh, like basically we can get the array list that is there for one or basically the adjacency list that is there for one and then we can add the element two. So basically this is what we have to do. So for every node, basically first we have to check that, hey, do we have an entry for this node? If there is an entry, then it's fine. Then just add this particular node to this particular list. But if there is no entry, then I know that there is no list at all. So first create that list and then get that list and then add that node, right? So instead of writing this three lines of code, it can be done using one method that we have. So we don't need to write these methods. Right. Instead, we can do like this. So adj dot compute if absent. Right. And it takes an integer, the key and a function. Right. The function is basically a lambda. Right. So don't worry too much about it. I'm going to show exactly what it is. So basically it will say, okay, uh, give me the key. That is one. And the next is basically nothing but the function which you want to do or which you want to execute if this key is not present. And that is very simple. That is just so this is a function. Right. And it just says, hey, create me a new array list. That's it. So this is basically nothing. Just remember this one line of code. And basically, it is going to say, Ki, hey, if this key is present, okay, then return the corresponding value. But if that key is not present, then call this function. And this call function is nothing, but it is creating a new array list. It is assigning this array list to one, right? And then it is returning me that array list. And since it is return, this method, computer absent is returning me that array list, I can easily add the to or whatever element I want to over here. So let's now look at the ways we can traverse a map. So one of the methods is uh, like 
uh, using the entry set function. So let's call this map dot entry set, right? And basically this gives me a set of entries. Uh, so this is going to be set of map dot entry of a string and integer. So since this map is of string and integer type, so that's why this map would be of a string and integer. So this would be an entry set. Now, why are we converting this to an, into a set? As I told in the video that map is not a collection, so it is not iterable, but we need to traverse uh, through this map. So therefore, we need to uh, convert the map into a collection and to convert a map into a collection, one of the methods is map.entry set, which basically gives us a set of entries. And since set is a collection that is an iterable, we can now iterate over this set like this. So using the for each loop, we can now iterate over this set. So now it's map.entry uh, string and an integer, we have an entry from the entry set and we can just traverse to the map and we can grab hold of that entry entry dot get key plus entry dot get value right so let's now print this you see with the one and channeler seven right so now there is another method that gives us uh, the map dot key set. Now, now instead of giving us the entries back, it will give us the set of keys. And keys are set because uh, keys are unique, so that is why it is running as a set. So it is a set of strings, right? Uh, uh, key sets from this, you know, map, and then we can just traverse the key set uh, that is key from the key sets, right? And we can just print out the keys. And we can also print out its corresponding values by using the map, then map dot get the key, right? So you can also do like this and you can also traverse the map like this. So you can see with the one and channel seven. Okay, so these are the two ways uh, in which we can traverse a map, right? So now uh, I think this is all about the hash map. So, and as I said, a linked hash map is just nothing. It has the same methods. It's just that the ordering is maintained. So I'm not going to show you that. Uh, now let's quickly move on to the next part. That is a sorted map. So let's now jump into the picture once again. So as you can see that we have a map and this map has a map.entry interface and using this map.entry we can iterate uh, over the map and uh, then we have the hash map which implements a map interface and then we have a linked hash map that extends the hash map which basically uh, if you want certain ordering and a hash map uses the hashing methodologies, right? So you got to have the equals and the hash map methods implemented for a hash map. Now we have the sorted map interface that is very similar and analogous to the uh, sorted set interface, right? And then we have the navigable map, very similar for this, or very similar to the navigable set, uh, which extends the sorted map and adds some extra functionalities like searching, right? And then we have the tree map and hash table. We are not going to talk about the hash table because hash table is very similar to a hash map with, as I said, just, uh, uh, it is thread safe and all those things. So just know the difference. But in reality, we don't really use hash map or we don't really need it for solving DSA problems. But tree map is something that we will use a lot in action and we will jump into that. Okay. So let's first look at the sorted map. So the sorted map and navigable map interface are the analogs of sorted set and navigable set. As I told you, the sorted map interface extends the map interface to provide the functionality for implementing maps with sorted keys. So here the keys would be sorted, right? In hash map, the keys are not sorted. And here the keys would be sorted according to your order that you will be mentioning, right? So now let's look at the sorted map interface methods. So in like very similar to the sorted set where you have the first and last methods, here you have the first key and the last key, right? So basically the first key returns you the smallest key and the last key returns you the largest key in the sorted map. So basically it is based on the ordering that you would be mentioning. And how can you mention the ordering? It can be an, either a natural ordering, that is the type of the key or the class of the key, right? Has to implement the compare rebuild interface, right? Where it will have the compare to method, that is a natural ordering. And if you are like uh, passing any total ordering, that is if you are passing any comparator to the tree map, very similar to what you were doing in the tree set and prior to you, here in the tree map constructor also pass a comparator and then that comparator function would be called for comparing the two elements and accordingly the key sets would be sorted. We would see that in action as well. Okay, and now we have the navigable map. So navigable map basically, just like a navigable set, extends the sorted map interface to uh, find the closest matches for specific targets, right? And it basically has new methods, right, uh, on top of the sorted map. So you can see that there's this poll first entry, poll last entry, first entry, last entry, right? It's very similar to, you know, the sets methods. And this then, then you have a ceiling entry, floor entry, higher entry, you know, closest entry. So these are the methods for finding the closest matches. So uh, like you can probably go to my my calendar video series where you would find these uh, methods in action like floor entry, higher entry, lower entry and ceiling entry. So very similar to three sets, uh, uh, like where we were searching on the elements, right? These would be searching based on the keys, right? The searching would be done based on the keys and all will be done in logarithmic time, right? So I think these are very self-explanatory and uh, like, and also I've put these functions into actions in 
my calendar series video and like in other DSA videos. Okay, now let's quickly jump into the tree map. So tree map is now the concrete implementation of this uh, 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 navigable map, right? And, and therefore it has all the methods of a map. It has all the methods of a sorted map as well as a navigable map. So operations on sorted maps rely on natural ordering of the keys. But if you can pass a comparator, a customized comparator to the constructor, then that uh, function would be used, right? So it, it tree map uses a balanced trees which deliver excellent performance for all operations, but searching in a hash map can be faster than a tree map as hashing algorithms usually prefer be better performance for search because it is constant time, but tree map is basically a logarithmic time. But however, if you want to maintain your keys in a solid fashion, then tree map is definitely the way to go. Now let's quickly jump into the tree map code a little bit. So navigable map, it will code against interfaces. So navigable map of, let's say, we want to sort, we want to maintain an integer integer map. Or let's say string, integer to string map this time. And let's say we have a map, tree map, it calls a new tree map, right? And we want to put some values, so the methods will be same. And these put methods are coming from the map interface. So there's nothing uh, like fancy that we are doing here, right? Then let's quickly insert some values or like, you can basically, you know, take the values from here. So these methods are going to be same. So just to show you, right? And even for traversing a tree map, you have this entry set methods, right? So these are like pretty simple. Uh, let me just copy this code. And I think uh, this should be two comma Raj. Okay, so let's, um, like quickly, you know, print a tree map. So now let's run this code. Uh, so you would see that one is Riddhi and seven is Chandler, right? So you can also traverse the tree map like this. So let me just copy this part and show you. Um, so this is would be very similar. This let me make it to tree map, and let me have to change this to integer and string. So basically, you can also traverse a tree map like this. Okay, cool. So let's now quickly print this. So you see one Riddhi and seven Chandra. Okay, so these are pretty similar. So as I said, the putting method, put methods and the remove methods will now take log in time since we're using a tree map. So be very careful about it. So as you can see, uh, the this tree maps are sorted according to the natural ordering of the integer class. That means ascending order first. Now, if you want to like pass a comparator, right? You want to sort it in descending order, right? So then you can pass a comparator, right? Like this where you would be saying, okay, uh, sort the keys and as a, you can only sort the keys, you can't sort according to the values. Uh, so yeah, sort the keys according to this order, that is the reverse order, that is the descending order. So now you see the Chandler method will come first, right? So let's see what is recommended now, uh, this down and you'll see the Chandler will come first, then the Raj and this then this one, right? So this is sorted according to its order. Okay, so there's another method, like let's say we, if you want to find the poll first method, give me the, like the first, uh, pull first entry, or it will give me Riddhi because right now remove the comparator. So it is sorted in ascending order. So the first first key is this. So it will give me Riddhi, right? Cool. Uh, then we have the poll last entry and all these things. You also have poll first key, last key. So I'm not going to show you that. Also one more method I will just show you, get ceiling key, right? And ceiling key basically is the, give me the key that is just greater than equals to a particular key. So let's say, let me pass three, right? And this should give me Chandler. Let's see. Yeah, just greater than equals to three is this particular entry that is seven. Since we search for the key, it returned me seven, right? If we want to search for the entry, then it should be ceiling entry, and then we can get whatever, like we can get the value, we can get the key, right? So this is all about tree maps. Again, it is very similar to then uh, to a tree set. Uh, and tree map finds the usages in a lot of places in DSA questions, right? So please, please, you know, you can go and check out my calendar series and also my graph series, and you would find all of these in action. Uh, also, I would highly recommend you, especially after you're done with the hash set and the hash map, uh, if you want to have an extensive practice, go to my hash map SD sheet video and solve all the questions on there. That way you would be also learning about the hashing algorithms. Also, you would be getting an extensive practice on the hash map, hash set, you know, all these things. Uh, uh, and because these these are concepts and if you're not uh, like coding this out on your own, uh, you, your muscle memory won't come into picture and as a result, you won't be able to remember most of these methods, right? Uh, just remember the interfaces, right? Try to uh, like know the methods of the interfaces. Uh, don't really try to memorize the methods in terms of class level because that won't help, right? Because th that's why the interfaces are there for, right? Uh, because let's say you have this add method that is a part of collection. And since it's a part of collection, we remember that list, queues, sets, they all implement the collection interface. So that's why all these methods 
will have add right but let's say map doesn't implement a collection interface so map will have a put method instead of an add right and then we in order to traverse a map since it doesn't extend the collection so we can't iterate through a map like we can do for any collection so here we need this key set method or the entry set method to traverse through a map right so these are very uh, so like try to remember things with the logic and eventually with practice you would remember these methods and all like it won't come in a day even sometimes i also forget so i can look up uh, through the documentations the oracle java doc documentations right so don't worry how about remembering these things too much eventually will solving a lot of questions and you know putting these things into action this will eventually get embedded within your head and sometimes even if you follow certain things you can obviously come back and uh, come back to this video and also you can you know uh, check out the oracle doc, java oracle docs right so if you go to this picture once again we see that we have covered iterables we have covered collections we have covered iterators we have covered all the implementations of list almost the, all the important implementations of list we have covered dq queues prior dq linked list you know we have covered sets we have covered hash sets three sets then we covered maps we covered hash maps linked hash maps sorted map navigable map tree map everything right so yeah our collection framework is mostly covered all the important things that we do find in action in our day-to-day -day, uh, software engineering life and also during the interviews as well i've covered most of them so this not only will help you in solving dsa problems but it will also help you while you would be working for a company when you will be joining a company and, and also when you would be sitting for any java based interviews because a lot of companies ask the questions on collections and most of the questions that i talked about trust me these questions are actually asked and if you understand these concepts from very scratch you would be able to explain it in a better way from here i would be making extra couple of videos like let's say i would like to make a hash map or a hash set uh, right from the scratch right in my own because many companies do ask you to create you know, your, own, your own hash map right or maybe your own added list right so these are the videos that i can make tutorial videos if you want such a video do comment down below also i would like to cover generic classes uh, so that you can better understand what these thing signifies and how this type erasure and all these things are converted uh, uh, by the compiler to the generic types and how these things are working behind the scenes. So that's why generic uh, one video, one dedicated video on Java generics, I will be bringing out to you guys soon. So don't forget to subscribe to this channel and press the like button for more such videos and to motivate me to create such content because this content takes a lot and lot of effort to create. You see, understand that you might be seeing this one video, right? One chunk of video uh, uh, dished out to you in front of you, but this took me a lot of time, you know, to, you know, first I have to read through a couple of things and then I have to join down what are the things that i want to teach you how can i teach you what are the order that i should follow so that you don't get confused then then recording this video and right i couldn't record this video in one shot because it's such a long video then editing this out so yeah it takes a lot of effort guys to you know come up with such videos tutorial videos uh, they're always uh, like pain for the creators to create it as compared to the other videos that we create so yeah please please uh, like motivate me to create such videos by you know sharing this video among your friends and the community liking this video and also don't forget to subscribe to my channel last couple of things just before going these are the things that you can probably look into and these are helpful while you're solving DSA questions. Uh, one is this arrays.sort method, right? So let's say we have an array, right? So now let's quickly, uh, there are two methods, right, for sorting. So one is like this arrays.sort. So let's say we have a method, uh, new, and let's we create an array. Like let's say we have one, two, three. And let's say, okay. Let me just quickly put some random numbers. Seven. Okay. Now, if you want to sort this array, you can use this sort method. This arrays dot sort, and it will sort out the array, right? Uh, then we have also called the collections of sort. So let's say you have a list. So you can use this collections dot sort, right? And you can pass the array list, right? So it takes this method. If you see, it takes an array list, right? And along with the array list, you can also pass a comparator, right? And you know what a comparator is. Basically, it will give you the compare function, right? Uh, also, there is one more thing. Let's say you want to sort a list like this, and uh, that is an array, right? And you want to sort it in descending order. So instead of just passing a comparator, like doing the B minus A, which you are doing, you can just pass this collections or reverse order. This is also a comparator, right? If you see this method returns a comparator as well, right? So basically, it is not this does nothing. This collections or reverse order reverses the ordering, the natural ordering that you ideally have for this uh, type, right? So if it is an integer and it is sorted in ascending order, this will reverse it. Right? So, it so it will do it in descending order. So whenever you want to do anything. In descending order right uh, do the collections or reverse order or else if you want to you know to like have pass any custom comparator you want to define your own logic based on any field or so feel free to pass any comparator function and if you want to be, do it in the natural ordering like in descending order of descending ascending order of integers or something like that then collections that sort yeah, is, is is the right way to go right and normally it sorts a list one more method we saw from list we can convert it to an array using the two array method at the start of the video now let's say we have an array like and we want to convert it to a list we can use this method that is arrays dot as list and it basically takes a, a like a, an object of type t use this method where we can pass this array right and we can store it in a list of integers so yeah 
one more thing to remember uh, we can only do this if this is of integer array type because it works on generic so we have to convert this int array into uh, a generic uh, integer then only this will work otherwise this will give an error and apart from that um, like instead of passing an array you can pass variable additive methods you can do something like this by separating a comma so this initial in, in turn would be con getting converted to an array and then it will be con getting converted to a list so basically you don't need to even create that so basically you see uh, over here this this takes this you can see this ellipsis right this, this three dots means it's a variable array method which means that this function can take n number of parameters and behind the scenes it gets converted to an array right so if you can pass four parameters five parameters six parameters one parameter and so on right but ideally we don't need to use this normally when we use this we generally pass an array and this please remember whenever you are passing an array this, this should be of the wrapper class and not the primitive data type otherwise you would run into errors and one last method before we end this video is the collections of binary search uh, which basically helps you in doing binary search that takes you know a list right it takes a key right so it takes a list it takes a key and also along with the list uh, that on which you want to do the sorting on and please ensure that the list has to be sorted as basic binary search uh, rules uh, and along with the key which you want to search you can also pass the comparator right so whenever you want to do some binary search uh, in java uh, there is this already method that is being created in collections or binary search you can use that so if it finds element it will give you that index if it cannot find an element so it will give you a negative index right and then and it will be of the formula minus insertion point minus one but the insertion point is the actual point where it was supposed to be inserted so read about it it's nothing fancy but normally in java i would say the binary search methods uh, like in lower bound upward bound methods that we normally use a lot in c++ those are not really that are there in java but they're kind of complicated and that is not going to really bother you that much because in most of the DSA interviews uh, you have to write your own binary search you have to write your own upper bound lower bound the interviewer won't really allow you to use this collections or binary search unless there is the, any specific use case so yeah I mean um, don't worry too much about it because this collections and binary search I didn't cover it in much detail because this is not really required I have not seen it much in action especially in the DSA interviews because most of the binary search question it involves you to solve the upper bound lower bound binary search it requires you to implement those things from scratch right and most of the questions will entail you to do that as well so I have not used collections and binary search a great deal but you can go and read about it and just about this giving my heads up so just in case you want to read about it you can go and read about it but other than that all the methods that i have talked about in this video they are going to be extremely important so don't forget to you know uh, also practice these videos uh so that it stays with you right and you know muscle memory so that's it for the video guys it's been a quite long video so let's end the video here and let's not drag it any further i hope you've enjoyed this video please please press the like button and that will motivate me a lot to make such videos also do let me know down below that what are the next topics that you want me to make a video on and also do let me know whether this video had any value to you and it was helpful for you also don't forget to subscribe to my channel press the bell icon so that every time i upload such a new video you are notified and also, also, uh, do share on Twitter or LinkedIn telling me that what is the best part or new part that you liked about this video or you learned something new from this video which you didn't know prior to this video. So I will be reading through all of your posts and comments. So yeah, that's it for the video guys. I will see you in some other video with some other tutorials. Till then, stay safe and goodbye.